I would like to introduce Dr. Zakir Nayak, the president of the Islamic Research Foundation. A medical doctor by professional training, Dr. Zakir Nayak is renowned as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts. He is 38 years old. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences after his public talks. In the last seven years, Dr. Zakir Nayak has delivered more than 700 public talks in the USA, Canada, UK, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain, Australia, South Africa, Botswana, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Guyana, South America, and many other countries. In addition to numerous public talks in India. He has participated in several symposia and dialogues with prominent personalities of other faiths. His public dialogue with Dr. William Campbell of USA on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science held in Chicago, USA on the 1st of April 2000 was a resounding success. Sheikh Ahmed Didat, the world-renowned orator on Islam and comparative religion, who had called Dr. Zakir Didat Plus in 1994, presented a plaque in May 2000 with the engraving awarded to Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Nayak for his achievement in the field of Dawa and the study of comparative religion. Son, what you have done in four years, he said, had taken me 40 years to accomplish. Alhamdulillah. Dr. Zakir Nayak appears regularly on many international TV channels in more than 150 countries of the world. He is regularly invited for TV and radio interviews. More than 100 of his talks, dialogues, debates, and symposia are available on video cassettes, video CDs, and audio cassettes. He has authored several books on Islam and comparative religion. Brothers and sisters, I present before you on the unique subject, similarities between Hinduism and Islam, Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Ala rasulillah wa ala ali asabi ajmain. Amma bad. A'udhu billahi minish shaitani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kul, ya ahil al-kitab, ta'alaw ila qalmitin sawa'im banina baynakum. Alla na'muda illa Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. Wala yattakhi zabaaduna baaddan arbaaban min dun illa. Fa in tawallaw. Fa kulu shadu. Bianna muslimun. Rabbi shuhli sadri. Wa yassir li amri. Wa halul ugdata min lisani. Jafka hukawli. Respected Brother Abdurrahim Green. Brother Zakir Ahmad. Brother Ashraf Muhammadi, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. The topic of this evening's talk is similarities between Hinduism and Islam. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Glorious Quran from Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Kul, ya hilal kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'alaw ila kalmitin sawa im banina baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. That we associate no partners with him. 
that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah fine tawallaw if then they turn back fakulu shadu say e be witness be anna muslimun that we are muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to almighty God this verse of the glorious Quran though specifically it mentions ahle kitab that the Jews and Christians but in general it can be used for different types of people according to me this verse of the glorious Quran is the master key for conveying the message to different types of people for coming on a common platform Allah says come to common terms as between us and you which is the first term Allah na'buda illallah that we worship none but one almighty God that we associate no partners with him in order to understand any religion it is not appropriate to try and understand religion by observing what the followers of that religion do because many a times the followers themselves are not aware about their own religions and about the scriptures therefore the best and the most appropriate method of understanding any religion is to try and understand the authentic sources the authentic scriptures of that religion if we have to understand Hinduism we have to understand the authentic sources the authentic sacred scriptures of Hinduism and the most sacred scripture in Hinduism are the Vedas the Vedas are followed by the Upanishads by the Itihas Rama and Baba, Bhagavad Gita, by the Puranas, Manusmiti, etc. So, if we understand the Veda and the other Hindu scriptures, we shall understand Hinduism in the correct perspective. If we have to understand Islam, we have to understand the sacred scriptures of Islam, that is, the glorious Quran, which is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God to the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and in order to understand the Quran the supplementary source in Islam is the Sunnah of the Prophet the authentic ahadith the authentic saying of the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him so if we have to understand Islam we have to understand the glorious Quran and the authentic sayings of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him before we discuss the similarities between Hinduism and Islam, let us understand the definition of Hinduism and Islam. The word Hindu, it has a geographical significance and refers to the people living beyond the river Sindhu or people living in the land watered by river Indus. And the historians, they say, that this word Hindu was first used by the Persians who came into India through the northwestern passes of Himalaya and historians also say that this word was used by the Arabs to describe the Indians according to the encyclopedia of religion and ethics volume number six reference number 699 it says that the word Hindu is nowhere mentioned in any of the Indian literature or Indian scriptures before the advent of Muslims to India and according to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru he writes in his book the discovery of India on page number 74 and 75 he says that the earliest occurrence of the word Hindu can be traced to a source eight centuries CE that's a tantric of 8th century CE that means the first time the word Hindu was used is in the 8th century CE in a tantric and it was used to describe a group of people it was never used in relation to religion the use of the word Hindu in relation to a religion is of late occurrence according to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru the word Hinduism is derived from the word Hindu and it was first used by the Englishmen 
the Britishers in the 19th century to describe the group of religious belief and practices of the people of India. According to New Encyclopedia Britannica, volume number 20, reference number 581, it says that this word Hinduism was first used by the British writers in the year 1830 to describe the religious beliefs of the people of India. So this word Hinduism is given by the Englishman. That's the reason the Hindu scholars, they say that Hinduism is a misnomer. The right word used should be the Sanatan Dharma. That means the eternal religion. Or it should be called as the Vedic Dharma. That is the religion of the Vedas. And according to Swami Vivekananda, who is a great scholar of Hinduism, he too says that the word Hinduism is a misnomer. The right word should be a Vedantist, the follower of Vedas. So in short, the word Hindu has a geographical significance. Its usage in relation to religion is of late occurrence. And the word Hinduism is coined by the Englishman, which is nowhere to be found in any of the Indian scriptures earlier. It came into existence only lately. The Hindu scholars say the right word should be Sanatan Dharam, Vedic Dharam, or Vedantist. But all of these words are not to be found in the Hindu scriptures. Let us understand the meaning of the word Islam. Islam comes from the Arabic word Salam, which means peace. It is also derived from Silm, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. So Islam, in short, means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. And this word occurs in the glorious Quran and several authentic ahadith of the Prophet. It's mentioned in several places in the Quran, including Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, and Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 85. The word Muslim means a person who submits his will to Almighty God. And this too occurs several times in the authentic hadith and several places in the glorious Quran, including Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64. There's a misconception that Islam is a new religion which came into existence 1400 years back and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the founder of this religion. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on the earth. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of the religion of Islam, but he is the last and final messenger of Almighty God. In this talk of mine, on similarities between Hinduism and Islam, I will not be speaking about those similarities which are known by almost all the followers of both the religions. For example, both the religions say that you should not steal. Both the religions say that you should speak the truth, that you should not lie. Both the religions say that you should be kind, that you should not be cruel. In fact, today, I'll be speaking about those similarities between Hinduism and Islam, which is not commonly known by most of the followers of the religion, except a few who are well versed with the scriptures. So let us discuss the similarities between Hinduism and Islam. The glorious Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 177, it says, it is not righteousness that you turn your face to the east or west, but it is righteousness that you believe in Allah, that you believe in the last day, that you believe in the angels, you believe in his books, and you believe in his messengers. There's a hadith mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, in the book of Iman, chapter number two, hadith number six. A person approaches Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and asks him, what is Iman? The Prophet replies that Iman is having faith in Allah, Almighty God, in his angels, in his books, in life after death, and in his messengers, and in destiny, in Qadr. So basically, there are six pillars of 
Iman in Islam. The first is believing in God. Number two, and his angels. Number three, and his books. Number four, and his messengers. Number five, in the hereafter, that's life after death. And number six, in Qadr, that is destiny. So let us discuss the similarities between Hinduism and the pillars of Iman in Islam. The first is the concept of God. Let us understand what is the concept of God in Hinduism. If you ask a common Hindu that how many gods does he believe in? Some may say three, some may say ten, some may say hundred, some may say thousand, while others may say thirty-three crores, three hundred and thirty million. But if you ask a learned Hindu who is well versed with the scriptures, he will tell you that the Hindus should believe and worship only one almighty God. But the common Hindu, he believes in a philosophy known as pantheism. The common Hindu says that everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the human being is God, the snake is God. What we Muslims say, everything is God's. G-O-D with an apostrophe, yes. Everything belongs to God. The tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the human being belongs to God, the snake belongs to God. So the major difference between the common Hindu and the common Muslim is, the common Hindu says, everything is God. We Muslims say everything is God's. G-O-D with an apostrophe, yes. The major difference is only the apostrophe, yes. If we can solve this difference, if we can solve this difference of apostrophe yes, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do you do it? Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but one Almighty God. Let us try and understand what the Hindu scriptures have to speak about Almighty God in Hinduism. Amongst the Hindu scriptures, one of the sacred scriptures are the Upanishads. It's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. It says, Ikkam evidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation, which means God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Shwetashvatar Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Na chasya kasij, janita na chadipa. Of him, there are no lords. He has got no master. Almighty God has got no parents, he has got no mother, he has got no father, he has got no superior. It's mentioned in the Svetash Patar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, Na asti, which means, of him there is no likeness. Almighty God has got no likeness. It's mentioned in the Svetash Patar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 20, Almighty God is imageless. No one can see him with his eyes. No one can see his form with his eyes. And amongst the Hindu scripture, the most popular is the Bhagavad Gita. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20. All those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. Bhagavad Gita chapter number 7 verse number 20 says that all materialistic people, they worship demigods, including idols. And amongst the Hindu scriptures, the most sacred are the Vedas. It's mentioned in Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, Na tasirpati ma asti. Of him, there are no images. Almighty God has got no images. He is unborn. Only he should be worshipped. It's mentioned in Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 8. Almighty God is imageless and pure. It's mentioned in Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. Andhatma pavishanti ya asambhuti mupaste. Andhatma means darkness. Pravishanti means entering. And asambhuti means the natural things like fire, water, air. So Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9 says, they are entering darkness, those who worship the natural things, like fire, water, air, etc. And the verse continues, they are entering more in darkness, those who worship the sambhuti, that is the created things, like table, chair, idols, etc. It's further mentioned in the Atharva Ved, book number 20, 
Hymn number 58, verse number 3. Dev Maha Asi. Verily, great is Almighty God. And amongst the Vedas, the most sacred is the Rig Ved. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 1, hymn number 164, verse number 46. Ikkam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vidhante. Truth is one. God is one. Sages call him by a variety of names. And the same message that God is one and sages call him by a variety of names is repeated in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 114, verse number 5. And Rig Ved alone in book 2, hymn number 1, gives no less than 33 different attributes to Almighty God. One amongst them is mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1, verse number 3, is Brahma. Brahma is called the Creator. If you translate into Arabic, it means Khalik. We Muslims have got no objection if someone says Almighty God is Khalik or Creator. But if someone says Almighty God is Creator, who has got four heads and on each head is a crown, we Muslims take strong exception to it. Moreover, you are going against Sveta Sitar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, which says, Na tasipati ma asti. Of him, there is no likeness. The other attribute given in Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1, verse number 3, is Vishnu. Vishnu is called the sustainer. It means the cherisher. If you translate into Arabic, it is somewhat similar to Rab. We Muslims have got no objection if someone calls Almighty God as Rab, Sustainer, or Cherisher, or Vishnu. But if someone says Sustainer is Almighty God who is relaxing on a couch of snakes, traveling in the sea, or flying in the air on the bird Garuda, who has four hands, one right hand is the chakra, the discus, the left hand he has the conch, we Muslims take strong objection to it. Moreover, you are going against Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, which says, Na tasipati ma asti. Of him, there are no images. Almighty God has got no images. It's further mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 1, verse number 1, Ma chadanadi sansad. Praise him alone. He alone deserves worship. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 6, hymn number 45, verse number 16, Ya ek it mushtihi. Praise him alone. He alone deserves worship. And the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism is Ekkam Brahm Dyuta Naste. Nehna Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan Eki hai. Dusra nahi hai. Nahi hai, nahi hai. Zara bhi nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you shall understand the concept of God in Hinduism. Let's understand the concept of God in Islam. The best reply that any Muslim can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam is quote to you Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Qul Allahu ahad. Say, He is Allah one and only. Allah Hussamad, Allah the Absolute and Eternal, Lam Yalid, Walam Yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Walam Kufwan Ahad. There is nothing like him. This is a four line definition of Almighty God given in the glorious Quran. Any person says so and so candidate is God, if that candidate fits in this four line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. And this is exactly what is also mentioned in the Hindu scriptures, the same four points. The first is, Qul huwa Allah ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Same as Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one, which says, Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. The second point, Allah hu samad. Allah the absolute eternal. Same thing which you mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 10, verse number three, that Almighty God is the supreme Lord of all the worlds. Point number three. Lam yalid, walam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. The same thing which is mentioned in Swetash Vatar Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine, that Almighty God has got no parents, He has got no master, He has got no mother, He has got no father. And the fourth is, 
There is nothing like him. The same which is mentioned in Sweta Sweta Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, and Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, which says, Natasya Patima Asti. Of him, there is no likeness. There is nothing like him. So if any person says so and so candidate is God, if that candidate fits in this four line definition, which is mentioned in the glorious Quran for a class, or the Hindu scriptures, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. For example, there are many people who consider Bhagwan Rajnish to be God. During question and answer time, one of the Hindu brothers said that we Hindus don't believe him to be God. I know, I never said that the Hindus believe him to be God. I said some people believe him to be God. I've read the Hindu scriptures. Nowhere do the Hindu scriptures say that Bhagwan Rajnish is God. But yet, there are many people who consider Bhagwan Rajnish to be God. So let us put this Bhagwan Rajnish to the test of Surah class and the verses of the Hindu scriptures. The first is, Kul Hu Ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Ekam evidityam. God is only one without a second. Was Rajnish one and only? Was he the only man who has claimed divinity? There are thousands of men who have claimed divinity. And especially in this country of ours, India, we have thousands who have claimed divinity. He is not the only one. But a Rajnish Bhakt will say, no, he is unique. He is the only one. So let's go to the next test. Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute eternal. Was Rajnish absolute eternal? We read in his biography that Rajnish was suffering from diabetes, from asthma, from chronic backache. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, chronic backache, from diabetes. The third test, Lam Yalid or Lam Yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. We know that Rajnish was born in the state of Madhya Pradesh. He had a mother and father. In 1981, he goes to America. And in the state of Oregon, he starts his own township known as Rajnishpuram. And he takes thousands of Americans for a ride. Later on, the American government, they arrest him and they put him behind bars. And he says that the American government, they gave me slow poisoning in the jail. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. And in 1985, the American government, they kick him out of USA and he comes back to India and in the city of Pune, he has his own center, which is today known as the Osho Commune. And if you go to a center Osho Commune, it's mentioned on his tombstone, Bhagwan Rajnish, Osho Rajnish, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. Never born, never died but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. They forgot to mention on his tombstone that he was not given visas to 21 different countries of the world. Imagine Almighty God coming in this world to visit the world and he requires visas to enter different countries. And the Archbishop of Greece said, if you don't remove Rajnish out of this country, we'll burn his house and the house of his disciple. And the last test, walam yakul lahu kufwan ahad. There's nothing like him. It's so stringent that no one besides the true Almighty God can pass. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. We know that Rajnish, he had a white beard, he had two eyes, one nose, one mouth, two hands like the human beings. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. For example, if someone says that Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You may have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the person who got the title, Mr. Universe, the strongest man in the world. If someone says, Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger, the moment you can compare God to anyone, whether it be thousand times or million times, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger or Dara Singh or King Kong, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. There's nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Almighty God given in the glorious Quran, which we call as the touchstone of theology. So all the gods 
that you people are worshipping, put him to the test of Surah Ikhlas. If your God passes the test of Surah Ikhlas and the Hindu scriptures have mentioned, then he's a true God. If he fails, he's not a true God. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, Allah says, Pulidullah Abidur Rahman, Ayamatadu, Falal Asma Husna. Say call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a correct name, it should be a beautiful name, it should not conjure up a mental picture. And this message that to Allah belongs the beautiful name, besides Surah Isra chapter 17, verse number 110, it's also mentioned in Surah Araf chapter number 7, verse number 180. Surah Taha chapter number 20, verse number 8, and Surah Al Hashar chapter 59, verse number 24, that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the most beautiful names. And if you read the glorious Quran, there are no less than 99 different attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Al Hakim, most gracious, most merciful, most wise, no less than 99. And the crowning one is Allah. Why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God? Because a person can play mischief with the English word God, which you cannot do with the Arabic word Allah. For example, if you add S to God, it becomes God's. That's plural of God. There's nothing like plural Allah. Qul huwa Allah wa ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. If you add D E S S to God, it becomes goddess, meaning a female god. There is nothing like male Allah or female Allah in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique, He has got no gender. If you add father to God, it becomes Godfather, He is my Godfather. There is nothing like Allah Father or Allah by Islam. If you add mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There is nothing like Allah Mother or Allah Amin Islam. If you prefix tin before God, it becomes tin God, meaning a fake God. There's nothing like tin Allah in Islam. That's the reason we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But when the Muslims are speaking to non-Muslims who may not be aware of the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if they use the English word God instead of the Arabic word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the way I'm doing today, I've got no objection. But I would like to remind them that God is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word Allah. And this word Allah is mentioned in the religious scriptures of most of the major religions. It's even mentioned in the Hindu scripture. If you read Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number one, verse number 11, one of the attributes of Almighty God in Rig Ved, book two, Hymn 1, verse number 11, is Allah. And if you look at the Sanskrit dictionary, the Hindu dictionary, it says Allah is the name of God. He's also mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the word Allah, in Rig Ved, book number 3, hymn number 30, verse number 10, and Rig Ved, book number 9, hymn number 67, verse number 30, is mentioned as Allah. Let's discuss the second pillar of Iman, that is, the angels. There's no concept of angels in Hinduism, but they have a concept of super beings which can do work which a normal human being cannot do. In Islam, the angels are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from light. They always obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't have a free will of their own. And angels have been created for particular purposes, for particular duties. For example, Archangel Gabriel has been created to get the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his various messengers. The third pillar of Iman is his books. First, we'll discuss the books in Hinduism. The sacred scriptures, the sacred books of Hinduism can be categorized into two types. One is the Shruti, the other is the Smriti. 
Shruti means that which is perceived, which is heard, which is understood, which is revealed. And the Shrutis are considered to be the word of Almighty God. They are of divine origin. And they are of two types, the Vedas and the Upanishads. The Veda is derived from the Sanskrit word Vid, which means knowledge. So Veda means knowledge par excellence. And basically, there are four types of Vedas. Rigved, Yajurved, Samved, and Atharvaved. The exact date when these Vedas came into existence is unknown. Which date exactly is unknown? The scholars differ. According to Swami Dhanan Saraswati, the founder of the Arya Samaj, he says that the Vedas are 1310 million years old. But most of the scholars, including the majority of the Hindu scholars, they say that the Vedas are approximately 4,000 years old. Exactly who was the first person who had the Vedas unknown. In which land it exactly came is not known. Who was the Rishi who wrote it or to whom it was revealed is unknown. In spite of all these things, yet the Hindus believe that the Veda is the word of God and it is the most sacred amongst all the Hindu scriptures. The next in authority are the Upanishads. There are more than 200 Upanishads. The Indian culture puts a number of 108. And principal amongst them, some say 10, some say 12. And Radha Krishna has mentioned 18 principal Upanishads. He has compiled them in his book. The other type of sacred books are the Smriti. Smriti means that which is remembered, that memory. And the Smriti are less sacred as compared to the Shruti. And they are not considered to be of divine origin. They are not the word of Almighty God. But they are written by human beings. And mainly they contain the rules and regulation how a human being should lead his life and also called as Dharma Shastra. Among the Smriti, we have the Itihas, the two great epics which all of us know, most of the Indians know. One is Ramayana, we deal with the story of Sri Ram, which most of the Indians know. The other is Mahabharat, which deal with the story of a feud between the cousins, the Pandavas and the Kauravas, and also deals with the story of Sri Krishna. And most of us, the Indians, they are aware of Mahabharat. The most popular amongst the scripture is the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is a part of Mahabharat. It contains 18 chapters. It is part of the Bhishma Parv. Chapter number 25 to 42. 18 chapters of Mahabharat. It is a guidance given by Sri Krishna to Arjun in the battlefield. The other sacred scriptures are the Puranas. Puranas means ancient. In Hindi we say Purana hai. Purana, ancient. So Puranas means ancient. It's very popular. And Maharishi Vyas has compiled 18 voluminous Puranas. It deals with the stories of gods and deities and deals with the story of the creation of the universe. Principle amongst the Purana is the Bhavishya Purana talking about the future. There are various other Hindu scriptures. We also have the Manusmriti, the law of Manu, and various other scriptures. But the most sacred amongst all the scripture, Hindu scripture, is the Veda. If anything contradicts with the Veda, the Veda has to be followed. It is number one in authority. Let's discuss the books in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 38, Allah says, what he called the Ajil Kitab, in every age, have we revealed a book? Almighty God has sent several revelations. But the last and final revelation is the glorious Quran, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And all the revelations, the previous revelations before the Quran, was sent only for a particular group of people and was supposed to be followed till a particular time period. But the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, was not revealed only for the Muslims or the Arabs. It was revealed for the whole of humankind. As I mentioned in the Quran in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1. 
in Surah Ibrahim chapter number 14 verse 52, in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 185, as well as in Surah Azumur chapter 39 verse number 41, that the Quran has been revealed for the whole of humankind. This is the most sacred amongst the scriptures of Islam. Number one, it is the word of Almighty God. And supplementary to the glorious Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the authentic sayings, the say a hadith of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The authentic hadith will never contradict the Quran. There will never be a conflict between the authentic say hadith and the glorious Quran. These two are the sacred scriptures, books in Islam. Let's discuss the fourth pillar of Iman, that is the messengers. First, we'll discuss the messengers in Hinduism. The common Hindus, they believe in avatar. Avatar is a Sanskrit word derived from au, meaning down, and tra, meaning Passover. So avatar means coming down or descending down. And according to Oxford Dictionary, it says that in Hindu mythology, avatar means descending of a revered soul or a deity on this earth in bodily form. So the common Hindu, he believes that avatar is almighty God becoming a human being and coming in this world. And the common Hindu believes that almighty God becomes a human being, becomes an avatar so that he could fight against unrighteousness and he can protect his religion. He comes down on the face of the earth to set the rules for the human beings, the do's and don'ts, and to guide them. And this concept they get from a verse of Bhagavad Gita, chapter number four, verse number seven and eight, which says, Yada yada hi dharmasya, glanir bhavati bharata, abhyutranam dharmasya, tatatman sajjay meham, which is a very common verse recited in the beginning of Mahabharata serial, which means that whenever there is decay of righteousness, O Bharata, and rise of unrighteousness, I manifest myself. Verse number eight says, to protect the good and to destroy the wicked, to establish the righteousness, I manifest myself in every age. Some bhavami yuge yuge. In every age, I manifest myself. This concept of avatar is also repeated in Bhagavad Purana, Khan 9, Adhyay 24, Shloka 56. It says that whenever there is rise of unrighteousness and waxing of sinfulness, I incarnate myself. Almighty God incarnates himself. So this concept of avatar, Almighty God become a human being, which most commonly is understood by the Hindus, is no way to be found anywhere in the Vedas. The avatar is not mentioned anywhere in the Vedas, which are the most sacred of all the Hindu scriptures. And the Hindu scholars, they say, many of the Hindu scholars who are pure Vedantists, who purely believe in the Vedas, they say that the Sanskrit word avatar is a position of Almighty God. It is possessive. It cannot refer to Almighty God himself. It can refer to Almighty God sending a man. So these scholars, they say that we have no objection Almighty God sending a man in this world. And if you read the Vedas, there are mention of several rishis who Almighty God has sent in this world to guide the human beings. Let's discuss the concept of messengers in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24. Wa imin ummatin nazir. There is not a nation or a tribe without a warner having lived among them in the past. Allah says in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 7. Wa li kulli qawmin had. And to every nation have we sent a warner. There are several messengers sent on the face of the earth. But the last and final messenger was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it's mentioned in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 40, 
ماکان محمد ابا احد مرجالکم ولاخ رسول اللہ و خاتم النبین و کان اللہ بکل شعین علیمہ Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the father of any of you men, but he is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the seal of the prophets. And Allah is all-knowing, full of knowledge. Since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger, unlike the previous messengers who were sent only for their people, and the message was meant to be followed in totality only for a particular time period, since Prophet Muhammad was the last and final messenger, he was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to the whole of humanity. Allah repeats the message in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا قَفَّةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَزِيرًا That we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the human beings yet do not know. And Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari Volume number one In the book of Salah Chapter number 56 Hadith number 429 The Prophet said that all the previous messengers that came before me, they were sent only for their people, for their nation. But I have been sent as the last and final messenger to the whole of humanity. In Islam, we don't agree that Almighty God has to come in this world and become a human being. This philosophy of Almighty God becoming a human being is called as anthropomorphism, which many religions believe in this philosophy that Almighty God became a human being. And they have a logic for that. What they say, that Almighty God is so holy, He is so pure, He does not know the shortcomings of the human being. How does the human being feel when he is hurt? How does the human being feel when he is in trouble? How does the human being feel when he has got problems? So that's the reason Almighty became a human being, so that He could set the rules, the do's and don'ts for the human beings. On the face of it, it sounds like a good logic. Almighty God, so holy, so pure, he does not know the shortcomings of the human beings. Therefore, to set the rules, he became a human being. I am asking a simple question. Let's suppose I manufacture a VCR, a video cassette recorder. Do I have to become a VCR, a video cassette recorder, to know what is good or what is bad for the VCR? If I manufacture a VCR, since I'm the manufacturer, since I'm the creator, I don't have to become a VCR to know what is good or what is bad for the VCR. What do I do? I write an instruction manual that if you want to play the video cassette, insert the cassette and press the play button. If you want to stop, you press the stop button. If you want to fast forward, press the FF button. Don't drop it from a height, it will get spoiled. Don't immerse it in water, it will get damaged. I write an instruction manual. I don't have to become a VCR to know what is good or what is bad for the VCR if I've created the VCR. Similarly, Almighty God, since He's the creator of the human beings, He doesn't have to become a human being to know what is good or what is bad for the human being. What does He do? He chooses a man amongst men and communicates with them on a higher level who we call as messengers. And He reveals this instruction manual to guide the humankind and the last and final instruction manual of Almighty God, it is the glorious Quran. The do's and don'ts for the human being is mentioned in the last and final instruction manual of the human beings, that is the glorious Quran. So the Islamic concept perfectly matches with the concept of the Vedas. It may not match with the common Hindus who believe that Almighty God becomes a human being, but nowhere does the Veda have the concept that Almighty God has become a human being. It has a concept that Almighty God has sent rishis, has sent people who were close to Almighty God so that they could guide the humankind. And there are mentions of several rishis and messengers in the Vedas. Let us discuss what do the Hindu scriptures have to speak about the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3. Khan 3, Adhyay 3, Shlokas 10 to 27, it says that the Malichas has spoiled the land of the Arabs. Arya Dharm is not to be found there. There was an enemy 
who I defeated earlier, but now he has been sent by a more powerful enemy. I will send a man by the name of Muhammad, peace be upon him, who will destroy these enemies and will guide the people to the true path. O oh, Raja Bhoj, you need not go to the land of the Pishachas, for I, through my kindness, will purify you here itself. A man in the injury disposition, he appears in front of Raja and says, O oh, Raja, I have been sent by Ishwar Paramatma. Arya Dharma will prevail. The religion of truth, Dinul Haq, will prevail in the world. I have been sent by Ishwar Paramatma to enforce a creed of meat eaters. My follower shall be a person who is circumcised, who does not have a shandy on his head, who has created a revolution, who keeps a beard, who gives the call for prayer, who eats all lawful things but will not have the flesh of swine. He will not be purified by herbs and shrubs, but will be purified by warfare. He will be called a Musalman. He will be a meat eater. Now this prophecy about a Rishi to come, the name of the Rishi is mentioned as Muhammad. Peace be upon him. And it says that he will guide the people on the straight path. And we know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam guided the Arabs. It was known as Yom al the days of ignorance. He guided them to light. And it says that his follower will be a person who circumcised. And the Muslims are circumcised. He will not have a shindi, will not have a tail on the head, and we Muslims don't have. Who will grow a beard, we Muslims grow a beard. Will create a revolution, will give the call for prayer, that is the Adhan. And we Muslims, we give the Adhan, that is the call for prayers. They will eat all lawful things, but will not touch the flesh of swine. And we Muslims, we don't eat pork. They will not be purified by herbs and shrubs, but will be purified by warfare. And we have been told in the Quran that we have to fight for the truth against Aryan oppression. They will be called Musalman. They will be meat eaters. This prophecy in Bhavishya Purana clearly specifies about the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his followers as Muslims have been described. He has been prophesied in several places. Time will not permit. I'll just give a reference to a few of the Bhavishya Purana. He's also prophesied in Bhavishya Purana. Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyay 3, Shlokas 5 to 8. He's even prophesied in Bhavishya Purana, Parva 3, Khanda 1, Adhyay 3, Shlokas 21 to 23. The last and final messenger has also been prophesied in the Atharva Ved, in book number 20, hymn number 127, mantra number 1 to 14. These are called as Kuntup Suktas. Kuntup in Sanskrit means a hidden gland in the abdomen, indicating that the meaning of these verses are hidden. They will be known later. And time will not permit to discuss all the 14 mantras. We'll just discuss the salient feature of the first four mantras. Mantra number one says, he is Narashansa. He is Kaurama, who will defeat 60,090 enemies. Mantra number two says, he is a camel riding Rishi. Mantra number three says, he is Mama Rishi. Mantra number four says, he is Vashchavis Reb. The first mantra says he is Narashansa. Narashansa is derived from Nar, which means a man or a person. And Shansa, as we know, Prashansa means praise. So Narashansa means one who is praiseworthy. And if you translate the name of the last and final messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, into English, if you translate Muhammad into English, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it means the praiseworthy. So Narashansa is the exact translation of the Arabic name, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's mentioned by name. <laughs> Further, it says that he is Kaurama. One of the meaning of Kaurama in Sanskrit is Prince of Peace. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the Prince of Peace. The other meaning is an immigrant. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated from Makkah to Medina. He was an immigrant. First mantra also says he will defeat 60,090 enemies. An approximate population of the people of Makkah who were against Prophet Muhammad was approximately 60,000. <laughs> Mantra number two says, he will be a camel riding Rishi. No Indian Rishi, no Brahman will ever ride a camel because according to Manu Smriti, chapter number 11, verse number 202, it says, a Brahman is forbidden to ride a donkey or a camel. So this indicates it cannot be an Indian Rishi. Mantra number three says, he is Mama Rishi. 
Mama comes from Maha, meaning great Rishi, and some of the other scriptures also say is Muhammad Rishi. Mantra number four says he is Reb. Reb means one who praises. And the other name of Muhammad sallallahu was Ahmad sallallahu which if you translate into English, it means the one who praises. So even his other name, that is Ahmad, translated into Sanskrit, Reb is mentioned in the Atharva Ved. So these mantras, kuntup suktas, they clearly specify no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I will just mention a few of the prophecies, there are several. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has even been prophesized in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 6. It says that Akaru, he will defeat 10,000 enemies without a fight. It is talking about battle of Azab, the battle of Khandaq. Chapter number 33 in the Quran. And Karu in Sanskrit means the one who prays, which is another translation of the second name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ahmad, the one who praises. It says this person, one who praises, that is Ahmad, he will defeat 10,000 enemies without a fight. And we know in the battle of Khandaf, the enemy is approximately 10,000 in number, and the battle was won without a fight taking place. He's also prophesied in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 7. It says that the Abandu, he will defeat 60,090 enemies and the 20 chiefs. Abandu in Sanskrit again means one who praises, that is the translation of the name Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It also says that he'll be an orphan. And we know today from history that there were approximately 20 chiefs of Makkah which were defeated by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the population of Makkah against the Prophet was approximately 60,000. This prophecy is also repeated in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 53, verse number nine. But the Sanskrit word is Sushrama. Sushrama in the Sanskrit dictionary, again, it means one who praises, which is the translation of the name Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are various prophecies. Time will not permit us to go into the detail. He is also prophesied in the Psalm Ved, in Uttar Chik, mantra number 1500. It says, that Ahmad has been given the eternal law. He is mentioned by name also as Ahmad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He has been given the eternal law, that is the glorious Quran, that is the Sharia. But if you read the translation of this verse, because Ahmad is an Arabic word, they could not translate it, so they thought it was Ahmati. And Ah and Mati in Sanskrit means my father. So it says, my father has given me eternal law. So the translation, if you read it, differs, but the original script mentions the word Ahmad. And the word Ahmad is even mentioned in other places in the Hindu scriptures, including Psalm Ved, Indra, chapter number two, Mantra 152. He is even mentioned as Ahmad in Yajur Ved, chapter number 31, verse number 18. In Rig Ved, book number eight, hymn number six, verse number 10. He is also prophesied by name Ahmad in Atharva Ved. Book number 8, hymn number 5, verse number 16, as well as Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 126, mantra number 14. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, besides being mentioned as Ahmad, one of his names, he is also mentioned as Narashan Sa in several places in the Hindu scriptures. And as I mentioned earlier, that Narashan Sa is derived from Nar, which means a man or person, and Shansa, which means Prashansa, praiseworthy. So Narashansa means a person who's praiseworthy. That is exact translation of the name of the last and final messenger Muhammad Wasallam into English. He is mentioned by Narashansa several places in the Hindu scriptures in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 13, verse number three. Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 18, verse number nine. Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 106, Verse number four, Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 142, verse number three, Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number three, verse number two, Rig Ved, book number five, hymn number five, verse number two. Rig Ved, book number seven, hymn number two, verse number two, Rig Ved, book number ten, hymn number 64, verse number three, Rig Ved, book number ten, hymn number 182, verse number two, Yajur Ved, chapter number 21, verse number 31, Vajur Vay chapter number 21, verse number 55, Yajur Vay chapter number 20, verse number 37, Yajur Vay chapter number 20, verse number 
57. Yajurve chapter number 28, verse number 2. Yajurve chapter number 28, verse number 19. Yajurve chapter number 28, verse number 42. You can keep on quoting only the references where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been mentioned by name as Narashansa in several places in the Hindu scriptures. You can give a talk for days together only on prophecies of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Hindu scriptures. I will just mention one more last prophecy about the Kalki Avatar. And he has been prophesied as Kalki Avatar in the Bhagavad Purana. Khanda 12, Adhyay 2, Shlokas 18 to 20. It says that he will be born in house of Vishnu Yas, a noble-souled Brahmin who is the chief of the village of Sambhala. And he will be called as the Kalki. Mantra number 19 and 20 says that he will be the supreme lord of the worlds. He will be given supernal knowledge and character and will be given eight special characteristics, eight special qualities. He will be given a steed, a horse, by the angels, and he will ride a horse carrying a sword in his hand. And he will defeat the enemies, and he will be helped by the angels. He further prophesies in Bhagavad Purana, Khand 1, Adhyay 3, Shokas 25, that he will be born in the Kalyug. This Kalki Avatar will be born in Kalyug, in which the kings will behave like robbers. And he'll be born in the house of Vishnu Yas, and will be called as Kalki. Same Kalki Avatar is even mentioned in the Kalki Purana, in chapter number 2, verse number 4, which says that he will be born in the house of Vishnu Yas. Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 5 says, he will be helped by four companions in spreading his religion. Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 7, it says that he'll be helped by the angels in the battlefield. Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 11 says that he'll be born in the house of Vishnu, yes, in the womb of Sumati. And Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 15 says he'll be born in the first half of Madhav month. You can only give a talk on Kalki Avatar. I'll just mention the points in brief. That these prophecies, what do they say? Point number one that it says that the name of Kalki's father will be Vishnu Yas. Vishnu Yas, if you translate, means the worship of Vishnu, worshipper of God. And the name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's father was Abdullah, which also means worshipper of Allah, worshipper of God. Point number two, the name of the mother of Kalki Avatar will be Sumati. Sumati, if you translate into English, it means peace. And the name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's mother was Amina, which we translate into English means peace. <laughs> Further says that he will be born in the village by the name of Sambhala. Sambhala, if you translate, means a place of serenity and peace. And similarly, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in Makkah. It was known as the Darul Aman, the place of peace and serenity. So it is also mentioned that he'll be born in Makkah. It further says he'll be born in the house of the chief of Sambala, house of the chief of Makkah, which we know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, that he was born in the house of the chief of Makkah, born in the Quraysh family. It further says that he will be born on the 12th day of the first half of the month of Madhav. And we know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in the first half of the lunar month of Rabbi Awal on the 12th day. This prophecy that he was born on the 12th day of Madhav is the same as 12th day of Rabbi Awal. Further, it says that this Kalki Avatar, he will be a final messenger. Exactly what's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 40, where it says, Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim mirjalikum, wala khi Rasulullah, wa khatamun nabiyin, wa kana Allah bi kulli shayin alima. Which means that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the father of any of you men, but is the messenger of Allah, and he is the seal of the prophets, the final messenger. Allah is all-knowing, full of knowledge. Further, it says that this Kalki Avatar, he will get knowledge from Parsuram, the Almighty God, in a mountain. 
And we know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first revelation he got in Garahira, Jabal Nur, the Mount of Nur, in Garahira. And the Prophet further says that he will go towards north and come back. And we know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated from Makkah northwards for Medina and he came back to Makkah victoriously. Further, it says that this Kalki Autar, he will be an example to the whole world. He'll have an impeccable character, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Kalam, chapter number 68, verse number 4, that verily thou art standard on the highest standard of character. It's further mentioned he'll be given eight special qualities. And in Kalki Purana and Bhagavad Purana, the eight qualities mentioned is wisdom, self-control, respectable lineage, revealed knowledge, valor, charity, gratefulness, and measured speech. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was known for all these eight qualities. Furthermore, it's mentioned he will be a teacher of the world, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Sabah, chapter 34, verse number 28, Wama arsalnaka illa kafatal nas bashiro wa nazirao that we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger giving glad tidings and warning them against sin but most of the human beings they do not know it further says that this kalki avatar he will be given a steed by almighty god and we know muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given the burakh by which he did the miraj that the ascension to the heavens it further says this kalki avatar will ride a horse and will carry a sword and we know muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he took part in most of the battles, most of them which are foreign self-defense. And even though he was a leader, he physically took part, he rode the horse, and he even caught the sword in the right hand. Further, the prophecy says that he'll be helped by four companions to spread the religion, the deen. And we know it refers to the four khalifas, the Khulfa Rashidin, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali. May Allah be pleased with them all, who later became the Khulfa Rashidin the rightly guided Khalifas of Islam who spread the religion further. It also says that this Kalki Avatar will defeat the enemy and guide the people to the right track. And we know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam defeated the enemies and he guided the Arabs from Yawm al-Jahiliya, the age of ignorance, he guided them to the true path. And the final point mentioned is that he will be helped by the angels in the battlefield. And we know Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was helped by angels in several battles, including the Battle of Badr which is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse 123 to 125, as well as Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 8 and 9. So this prophecy of Kalki Autar, the last and final messenger, befits no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. <laughs> the fifth pillar of Iman is life after death, the hereafter. First we'll discuss the life after death in Hinduism and then Islam. The common Hindu, or most of the Hindus, they believe in the cycle of birth, death, rebirth, death, rebirth, known as the samsara. It's also called as the theory of reincarnation or transmigration of soul. And this philosophy of samsara, it came about because the scholars, they could not justify that how could Almighty God be unjust that some human beings are born wealthy, some human beings, they are born poor, some human beings, they have been given health, some have got diseases. So Almighty God cannot be unjust. Therefore, they came with the philosophy of samsara based on the verse of Bhagavad Gita, chapter number two, verse number 22. It says, that as a human being, he changes and throws away the old clothes and wear new clothes. Similarly, the soul throws away the old material body and puts on the new body. A similar message is given in Bhain Hankar Upanishad, part four, chapter number four, verse number three. It says that whenever a caterpillar climbs onto a grass of blade, he jumps onto a new blade. Similarly, a soul takes a new body. So based on these verses of the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, the scholars to justify 
they had this theory of samsara, cycle of birth, death, rebirth. And they believe in the concept of karma, that is action. Action not only of the body, but action even of the soul. Based on the philosophy, as you sow, so shall you reap. Whatever you sow, you shall reap. They believe also in dharma. Dharma means deed, righteous deed. How you live your life, family life, life in society. If your karma is based on dharma, you will have good karma. And they also believe in moksha, that is nirvana. That is ultimate salvation from the cycle of birth, death and rebirth. If you have no deeds in which you can be reborn, you get moksha. Now this philosophy, they say that a human being is born handicapped, is born with diseases, maybe because in his previous birth, he did some evil deeds, therefore he's being punished in this world. So this philosophy came up to justify that Almighty God cannot be unjust. But if you read the Vedas, nowhere do the Vedas speak about the cycle of birth, death and rebirth. Nowhere do they speak. Nowhere in the Vedas is the concept of samsara there. What it does mention is the punar janam. Punar in Sanskrit means next or again and janam means birth. So punar janam means next birth or next life. The right translation of punar janam is next life. It doesn't mean life, death, life, death, life. That doesn't mean cycle of death and life. Punar janam, if you translate Sanskrit into English, it means next life. So Vedas have got no problem in agreeing next life. And if you read the Vedas, Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 16, verse number 4 and 5, it speaks about the next life. That there is a next life. But doesn't speak about death and life, death and life. And the Vedas also speak about Swarg, that is paradise, describing that there is rivers flowing beneath of milk. You'll have all kinds of fruit. You'll have peace in Swarg. In several places, in Atharva Ved, book number 2, Atharva Ved, book number 4, book number 6, Rig Ved, book number 10, several places. Rig Ved even speaks about Narak, that is hell, describing somewhat like a fire, a torment of fire for punishment. In several places in Rig Ved, book number 4, so if the concept of swarg and nark is there, that after a person dies, he will get a reward and punishment. So what is the requirement of him to come again in this world? So according to the Vedas, the Vedas believe in next life only once. And there, depending upon your deeds, you will either go to paradise, swarg, or nark, that is hell. It doesn't believe in the concept of birth, death, and rebirth, which most of the common Hindus believe. And regarding the logical reply, why Almighty God, make some people handicapped, some people healthy, we'll discuss in the concept of life after death in Islam. In Islam, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 28, that don't you have faith seeing that Allah gave you life where you didn't have life? Then he caused you to die. Then again he'll give you life, and to him will you return? Allah says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allazi khalaq al mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Allah says in Sulaiman Imran chapter 3 verse 185 that Kullu every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. And anyone who is saved from the hellfire and enters Jannah, the garden, he has achieved the objective of this world. For this life is nothing but mere chattels of play and amusement. So you are according to Islam, a human being comes in this world only once. And this life is a test for the hereafter. And depending how well you follow the commandments of Almighty God or you don't follow the commandments of Almighty God, based on that, in the next life, in the hereafter, depending which ways move, you will either go to heaven, that is paradise, or hell, that is narq. And the description of paradise, Jannah, in Arabic, Jannah is translated as garden, is given in several places in the Quran, and the concept is similar, that there are rivers flowing beneath, rivers of milk and honey, fruits of all kind, you'll have pomegranates, you'll have peace, there will not be any sin. Quran also talks about hell, about Jahannam, similar to the Vedas, as torment of hell, whose fuel will be men and stones, Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 23-24, and many places the Quran even speaks about hellfire. 
So the concept of hell and heaven in Islam is somewhat similar to the concept given in the Vedas. And if you read the Vedas, it is similar to the Islamic concept that you come in this world once, and next life, depending upon your deeds, upon your karma, next world you'll either go to hell or heaven. But it disagrees with the common philosophy with the Hindu scholars talk about the samsara. The reason they came up with this philosophy of samsara, as I told you, they could not logically justify that how could Almighty God make some people born in a rich family, some in a poor family, some are born healthy, some are born with congenital defect. The logical reply for this is given in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah an kabut chapter number 29, verse number 2, that do you think just by saying, I believe, Allah will let you go and Allah will not test you? That even if you say that I believe in God, do you think Allah will not test you? You are bound to be tested. Every human being is bound to be tested, Allah says. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 155, that surely we will test you with fear and with hunger, with loss of property, loss of lives, loss of fruits of your toil. And only those will pass, those who are patient and perseverance. That means Almighty God will test you with hunger, with fear, with loss in property, in health, in different things. Allah says in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 28, that your wealth and your progeny is a test for you. The wealth and the progeny, your children, are a test for you. So in Islam, we believe that this life is a test for the hereafter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests different people in different ways. And depending upon the surroundings and the facility Allah gives you, he will test you accordingly. For example, if the question paper is difficult, the teacher corrects the paper leniently. If the question paper is easy, the teacher corrects the paper more strictly. So similarly, depending upon the facility Allah has given you, he will test you accordingly. And Allah says in Surah Anfal, chapter 8, verse number 28, that your wealth is a test for you. Now regarding the logical concept why some people are born in a rich family, some people in a poor family, Allah says wealth is a test for you. The third pillar of Islam is every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that saving in charity every lunar year. So maybe very few rich people will actually give the 2.5% of the excess wealth in charity. Majority may give only part of it. So in charity, they'll get less marks. Some people will not give, so they'll get zero marks. For a poor man who has a saving of less than 85 grams of gold, he doesn't have to give zakat. So in zakat, they get full marks. We think, ah, bichara, garib admi, poor man. Allah says, wealth is a test for you. And a prophet said, it is difficult for a rich man to enter Jannah. So wealth is a very difficult test. <laughs> Imagine, in the year 2002, doing examination, a very difficult question comes. In the year 2003, it doesn't come. So you should be happy. Good, this question didn't come. We should not cry. But we human beings, we think opposite. You know, he doesn't have wealth. He's a poor man, you know, a sad person. It is good for him, the difficult test of wealth he's not undergoing. If he had the wealth, the test of the wealth is very difficult. Maybe you'd have failed. So Allah tests different people in a different way. Regarding the reply, why some people are born healthy, some people are born with disease, with congenital heart defects, Allah says in Surah Anfal, chapter 8, verse 28, that your children are a test for you. So the person who's born, even if he's born handicapped, we in Islam believe every child is masoom, is sinless. We don't believe that the child did some bad deeds in the previous birth, therefore he's born handicapped. We believe every child born in any family, he's sinless, he's masoom. But he may be a test for the parents. The parents may be pious people, may be offering five times salah. Maybe Allah wants to test them further. And if Allah wants to give you a great reward, he has to test you in a higher level. Maybe, for example, if you sit for a graduation in arts, to pass a BA degree in arts is easy. If you pass, you become a graduate. But to pass an MBBS exam is more difficult. But if you pass, you get a doctor, more honor. But the chances of passing MBBS is much less. 
But if you pass, you get great honor. Similarly, maybe the parents, they are pious people. Almighty God wants to give them Jannat Firdos. Allah wants to test them that after giving handicapped children, yet do they believe in Almighty God or not? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells different people with health, with disease, with wealth, with poverty, all these are tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who tells different people in different ways. That's the reason there are differences in the human being. It is not because Almighty God is unjust. He's testing different people with different ways and depending upon the facility he has given you, he will reward and punish you accordingly. So this answers the logical concept which the scholars could not realize. The sixth pillar of Iman is Qadr, it's destiny. In Hinduism also the belief that Almighty God destines things in the human being. And similarly in Islam we believe Almighty God has destined where a person is born, when will he die, etc. And whether he'll be born in a rich family or a poor family, it is the prerogative of the teacher to set the question paper. What question she wants, she will give you. And you have to answer accordingly. You cannot say, okay, I don't want this question, I want that question. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destines people with certain things, where you'll be born, when you'll be born, you'll have wealth or not, whether you'll have health or poverty, when you'll die. And after this has been destined, whether do you follow the commandments given by Almighty God in the final revelation, that is a test for the hereafter. This is known as destiny. This was in brief regarding the pillars of Iman in Islam and the similarities in Hinduism. Time will not permit us to discuss the various similarities. We'll just discuss a few other similarities which are not known by the common Muslims and the Hindus that exist in both the religions. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Allah says, Ya ayyuh allazina amunu, O you believe, innam al khamru wal maisuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabu wal azamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishtum min amali shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork, first anibu lalukum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Here Allah is telling us that intoxicants, gambling, fortune telling, idol worship, these are Satan's handiwork, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. These messages, also repeated in the Hindu scriptures. If you read Manu Smriti, chapter number 9, verse number 235, it prohibits the drinking of alcohol. It says that a priest killer, a liquor drinker, a thief, a violator of his guru's marriage bed, all these four people, and individually, they commit major sins. And few verses later, Manus Mithi chapter number 9, verse number 238, gives the punishment for these people. It says that these miserable men, no one should eat with them. No one should sacrifice for them. No one should read to them. No one should marry them. They should wander throughout the earth, excommunicated from all the religions. The punishment for having alcohol in Hinduism is, that no one should eat with him, no one should read to him, no one should sacrifice for him, no one should marry him. He should be excommunicated from all the religions and wander throughout the earth. Even this punishment is not mentioned in Islam for a liquor drinker. Next, it further says in Manusmiti, chapter number 11, verse number 55, it says that a drinker, a priest killer, a person who steals, a person who violates his guru's marriage bed, all these people and all those who associate with him, they commit major sin. But not only if you drink, if you associate with the drunkard, according to Manusmiti chapter number 11, verse number 55, you are doing a major sin. Manusmiti chapter number 11, verse number 94 says that liquor has been derived from the dirt, from the excreta of rice, and dirt is evil. So a priest, nor a ruler, nor a commoner should drink liquor. 
there are various places in the Hindu scripture where liquor has been prohibited, including Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 225, Manusmriti, chapter number 7, verse 47, Manusmriti, chapter number 7, verse number 50, Rigved, book number 8, hymn number 2, verse number 12, Rigved, book number 8, hymn number 21, verse number 14. In several places, alcohol, liquor has been prohibited in the Hindu scriptures. Now, second point, mentioned for a minor chapter number 5, verse number 90 was, Ya ayyuhal lazina amunu, ennam al khamru al maisuru, more certainly intoxicants and gambling. Hindu scriptures even prohibit gambling. If you read Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 34, verse number 3, it says a gamester, a gambler, he says that his wife leaves him aloof. His mother hates him. And he says that no one comforts this wretched man. And after a few verses, Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 34, verse number 13, it says that do not play with dice. Rather, cultivate the land. And whatever you earn, be satisfied with that earning. Gambling has also been prohibited in Manusmiti, chapter number 7, verse number 50. It says drinking, gambling, women, and hunting. All these are four major sins in order. Drinking alcohol has also been prohibited in Manusmriti, chapter number 7, verse number 47. In Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 221 to 228. It's also prohibited in Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 258. The third thing, well, Anzabu al Azamu, dedication of stone, divination of arrows, idol worship we already discussed earlier. Divination of arrows, fortune telling. It's mentioned in Manusmiti, chapter number 9, verse number 258, that a person who earns his living by telling good things, a soothsayer and a fortune teller, Manusmiti chapter 9, verse 262 says that the king shall punish them according to the severity of their crime. So even fortune telling and soothsaying have been prohibited in Manusmiti, chapter number 9, verse number 258 to 262. Quran further says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 188. Quran prohibits bribing. Quran says, Use not your wealth as a bait for the judges, in order you may eat other people's wealth. Quran prohibits involving in bribe. The same thing is mentioned in Manusmiti, chapter number 9, verse number 258. It says that a person who deals with bribe, a deceiver, a defaulter. All of them, verse 262 says, that the king shall punish them according to the severity of the sin. Furthermore, Quran prohibits the eating of pork in no less than four different places. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 173, Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 145, and Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 115, Hurrimat alaykumul maitu tu waddamu walahmul khanzeer, wa ma ahulla ali gherilla bi, forbidden for you for food, ah, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is invoked. Quran prohibits, besides other thing, the eating of the flesh of swine, pork has been prohibited. Pork has also been prohibited in the Hindu scriptures. It's mentioned in the Manusmiti, chapter number 5, verse number 19. It says that a Brahmin, knowingly, if he eats mushroom, if he eats dung heap pig, if he eats onion, a tame cock, or garlic, he shall fall. It's further mentioned in the Vishnu Sutra, chapter number 5, Verse number 49, that anyone who sells pork should be punished in the same way. Anyone who sells the forbidden meat, including pork, he should be punished in the same way. That means his opposite hands and legs should be lopped off. The Vishnu Sutra, chapter number 5, verse number 49 says, if anyone sells pork, the punishment for him is chopping off his opposite hands and feet. Even this punishment is not mentioned in the Quran. So, the Hindu scriptures are more against not having the flesh of pork as compared to Islamic scriptures. There are many misconceptions in Islam, and people always point a finger that why does Islam subjugate the woman by keeping her in the veil? And if we analyze 
that who is to decide what is modest? The Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. That whenever a man looks at a woman, any breath and thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. Next verse, Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31 says, say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not the beauty except what appears ordinary of, and draw her veil over the bosom, and display not the beauty except in front of her father, her husband, her son, then a big list of mehram is given. Basically, there are six criteria for hijab, which is given in the Quran and the Hadith. The first is the extent. For the man, it's from navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. There are many scholars who say that when they should be covered. The remaining five criteria are the same. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be tight so that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be transparent. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble and be a sign of the unbeliever. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. Similarly, if you read Hindu scriptures, it's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number eight, hymn number 33, verse number 19. It says, Brahma has made you a dame, made you a lady. So therefore, cast down your eyes and do not look up. Put your feet together and let not your garment reveal what your veil conceals. So according to Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 33, verse number 19, it says that the woman should lower the gaze. They should not stay at the opposite sex and they should wear a veil. Per that's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 10, Hymn number 85, verse number 30, that it is devilish and not right when a husband, he covers his thighs with the garments of his wife. That means wearing clothes of opposite sex is prohibited in Hinduism. It's further mentioned in Mahavir Charit, act number two, page number 71, when Sri Ram, when he sees Purusharam, he tells his wife Sita that Parusharam, he is our elder. You cast thy eyes and draw the veil. So Sri Ram tells his wife Sita that when the elder comes, you should draw the veil and look down. Further, if you read the books of historical records, we find the Indian ladies, many of them wear veils. There are coins in the post-Gupta age showing women, Indian women, wearing a veil and the veil coming up to the shoulders, some up to the arms. Even today, if you go in many Indian villages, we find that women, they cover their head. Some of them even cover their face. So here if you analyze the modesty level of a woman in Islam and Hinduism is the same that they have to be covered up. Furthermore, people talk about that why does Islam allow a man to have more than one wife? In fact, if you analyze most of the major scriptures, they permit a man to marry as many wives as they wish. If you read Ramayan, the father of Ram, King Dashrath, he had three wives. If you read the Vishnu Sutra, chapter number 24, verse number one, it says a Brahman can have four wives. If you read Mahabharat, Krishna had how many wives? Four, 10, 1,000, 10,000. Krishna had 16,108 wives. So when Krishna can have 16,108 wives, so why can't we Muslims have at least Four. <laughs> Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number three, marry women of a choice in twos, threes, or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. In Islam, you're allowed to marry two, three, or four, but if you can't do justice, you can only marry one. But if you can do justice, the maximum you can marry is only four, you cannot marry beyond that. And the reason why Islam allows polygamy, you can refer to my video cassette, Women's Rights in Islam. In the conclusion of my talk, I would like to mention that if we analyze from history that the Britishers, when they came to India, the Western philosophy, it influenced the Indian culture. And because of that, the Indian culture was going down. And towards the starting of the 19th century, we have several Hindu reformers. The pioneer amongst them is Raja Ram Mohan Roy, who was born in Bengal in 1772. He learned English, Arabic, and Persian. And he wrote a book in 1803, which spoke against idol worship. He believed in a philosophy of the Upanishads that believed in the universalism of Upanishad. And he said that Almighty God is one. 
He has got no images. He spoke against idol worship and said, Almighty God did not have avatars. He cannot become a human being. He even spoke against caste system. And when he formed his trust, the Brahma Samaj, he mentioned his trust deed. He mentioned the trust deed that no graven image, no carving, no sculpture, no statue, no picture, no portrait will enter in this building. And there were many offshoots of Brahma Samaj, but all of them believed in the same philosophy, God is one, God has got no images, idol worship is wrong, God does not become avatar. They were against the caste system. As far as the cycle of samsara was concerned, it was optional. You want to follow, follow. Don't want to follow, don't follow. One among the offshoot of Brahma Samaj was Pratna Samaj, which was founded by Justice Zanade. Justice Zanade in Brombe founded the Pratna Samaj, and there he followed all these principles, but was strictly for the upliftment of the woman and said that the woman should be educated. And a woman who becomes a widow, she should remarry. The other great reformer that we had was Swami Dhanan Saraswati, who founded the Arya Samaj in 875. He believed strictly in the Vedas, and he said that the Hindus should follow only the Vedas. And he strictly said that God is one. God has got no images. He spoke against idol worship. He said God Almighty doesn't have avatars. The other great reformer that most of us are aware is Swami Vivekananda, who founded the Ramakrishna Mission. And he too spoke that we should follow the Vedas. And he said, though 99% of the Vedas have been lost, today we have only 1% of the Vedas, which cannot be accommodated even in a large hall. But he said, that we should not call ourselves Hindus, we should call ourselves Vedantists, follow the Vedas. Now if we analyze that the Britishers came a few centuries ago to India to do business, but unfortunately they looted our country and they had the policy of divide and rule. And they saw to it that there were differences between Hindus and Muslims so that they could rule. And they even corrupted many of the Indian culture because of that, Hinduism went down. And that's the reason that in the early part of the 19th century, there was a surge of Hindu reformers, like Raja Ram Mohan Roy, like Justice Anade. Whatever I spoke in my talk, all have been picked up from these great scholars. I am just a student of comparative religion. All these things I've spoken of Hinduism <laughs> is not my own invention. All these have been picked up from these great Hindu reformers like Raja Ram Mohan Roy, like Justice Anna Day. I have only as a student of compared religion, I verified it. And what I did, whatever they spoke, the references weren't given. I went to the Hindu scriptures and I gave the references. Only thing I did was added the references, nothing else. <laughs> and all the things I mentioned about Hinduism, it was always backed up with quotation from the Vedas and the other Hindu scriptures. I'm aware Vedas are the most authentic. But the reason I've given quotation from the other scriptures also, because many Hindus, those who believe only in Vedas, even if they remove all the other quotations besides the Vedas, yet my talk will be 100% the same. But there are many Hindus, though they respect the Vedas, but they are more well aware of Bhagavad Gita and the Puranas. So because of that, I've quoted these scriptures also, so that they can come closer to the Vedas and come closer to the concept which is established in the Hindu scripture. The Britishers, they had the policy of divide and rule. And unfortunately, even I fell prey to that. I thought, how could Hinduism have similarity with Islam? Impossible. After reading books of these great scholars, these great reformers, and doing research, that's how this talk has come about. But the main reason that these Britishers, they had the policy of divide and rule, our country has got the freedom from the Britishers, but unfortunately yet, we are slaves to the policy of divide and rule. And unfortunately, most of our Indian politicians, if not all, most of them, they follow the same rule of divide and rule to get their votes. <laughs> India is the country in the world which has the maximum number of rights. Every day we have more than one right on average. And if you go to the background of these rights, Almost all of these rights have been engineered by politicians for the vote bank. There was somebody who told me that the politicians, they add fuel to the fire. 
I told them, no, he's wrong. I don't agree that the politicians add fuel to the fire. The politicians, they add fire to the fuel. <laughs> the fuel, most of the time, is constructive. You know, the vehicles run with fuel, factories are working, the fuel makes the construction of a country. They add fire to it, and they call destruction of the country. There was an article that came last month in Times of India in Bombay. It says that according to Japan, in the next 20 years, India will be the superpower of the world. <laughs> we know that before the Britishers came to India, India was a superpower. Now, if all the Indians, all the Hindus, and all the Muslims, if we go back to our scriptures, and for the established truth of the scriptures, believing in one God, believing in the final messenger, believing life after death, inshallah, India will be a superpower. Only if all the Indians, the Hindus and the Muslims, if you go back to the scripture and follow the scriptures, we will be a superpower, will be far superior to the Americans, far superior to America and the European countries, inshallah. <laughs> it is clearly mentioned in the Vedas. Rig Veda tells us in book number 10, hymn number 71, verse number 4, seeing the words they see not, hearing the words they hear not. You see it's mentioned in the scripture so clearly, yet you see not. You hear the words of the scripture, yet you hear not. Same thing the Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 44. You study the scripture, yet you don't follow it. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 18, Summum, bukmun, umyun, formula, arjun. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, they will not do the true path. We feel and we see that most of the religious leaders of most of the major religions, whether it be Islam, Christianity, or Hinduism, they prevent their followers from reading the scripture with understanding for their own ulterior benefits. Because if the followers read the scriptures, then maybe they will not be able to get their ulterior benefits. I have given a talk earlier on the topic, Al-Quran, should it be read with understanding. If we understand Quran, the best way to understand is to learn Arabic as a language. If you cannot learn Arabic as a language, read the translation of the Quran in the language you understand the best. And we have the Quran translated in the major language of the world, Similarly, if you analyze that though there are many sects in Islam, there are many sects, but the differences that are there in the sects are very small, are very minute, they are negligible. The major factor of all these sects of Islam, they are the same, that Almighty God is one, that the Quran is the same, that the Messenger of Muhammad is the same, because the reason is the language in which the Quran was revealed, the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, the language was Arabic, and today, yet, Arabic is a living language. That's the reason William Moore, Sir William Moore, was a staunch critic of Islam, yet he mentioned that the book that has maintained purity in the past 12 centuries, he said 200 years ago, is the glorious Quran. Because it was revealed in a language, Arabic, which is a living language. My request to the Indian government and to my dear Hindu brothers and sisters is that you should revive Sanskrit. It's my humble request to the Indian government and my Hindu brothers and sisters. You learn Sanskrit, go back to your scriptures, go back to your Vedas and realize that God is one. You understand that God has got no images. You understand God has got no avatar. You should understand and realize who is the last and final messenger. You should understand this life is a test for the hereafter. And then only we Muslims and Hindus can come together and build a great Indian nation. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the glorious Quran of Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 108. Ya ayyuwa nas, say, O humankind, truth has arrived from your Lord. Those who receive guidance, they do good for their own souls. And those who go astray, they do it at their own loss. I have not been set up as a manager of affairs over you. Jazakallah <laughs> khair, Dr. Zakir Naik, for this enlightening talk on the subject 
similarities between Hinduism and Islam. We'll now throw the floor open for an open question and answer session. But before that, let me make the rules clear so that we can conduct the session in a proper and a fit manner. Please make a cue at the four mics provided to you. There is a mic provided for the ladies at the back, a mic for the gents at the back, and a mic each at my right and my left in the front. Please understand that this is a question time and not a lecture time. So please pose your question, be precise and to the point. The volunteers at the mic are requested to see to it that uh, the non-Muslims in the queues are given first preference to pose their questions. We now begin the question answer sessions and can we have the first question from the brother on my left. Yes. This soul's name is Yogananda. Uh, this opportunity this soul takes to pay the thanks to Almighty Allah for today, peace to humanity has been seeded through Dr. Zakir Naik. Peace to humanity for the Hindu Muslim unity. So, thanks very much for your very great effort he has taken by going through all the Vedas and other things. Really big task he has done. But still more is the another part of in Hinduism that is he has touched the matter of uh, Vedanta. There is Siddhanta is another one is there. That also if he concentrates still more he can give very good evidences and it will be very good for the peace to humanity for the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I'm thankful to the brother's comment. May Allah accept our effort. And I'm aware, brother, there are many things more we can talk. Normally, my talk is for one hour to one hour 15 minutes. Today, I requested brother Zakir to speak for one and a half, and I spoke for one hour 40 minutes. And I'm aware that whatever we do, whatever we do research, it's just a drop in the ocean. And for more information, you can refer to my cassettes on concept of God in major religions, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the major world religious scriptures, and there are many books I've written on these topics as well on Hinduism. Inshallah, if a person goes through them, they'll get more knowledge on the similarities on Hinduism and Islam. Hope that's the question. It seems we have a non-Muslim brother on that mic. Yes, brother. Can we have your name and your profession so that we get to know well, your background? Well, I am Sashank Sekhar from Ranchi Jharkhand. I am doing my engineering from Satyavan Engineering College here. Sir, your lecture, after hearing a lecture, our misbelief about Islam and Muslims vanished today. <laughs> Sir, I have been to Jammu and Kashmir and have seen the trauma and pain that the people are suffering there because of the so-called jihad of some Muslims. Sir, my question is, that does Islam support such activities? If no, then what actually the word jihad means? Is it in accordance with the 56th verse of the 7th chapter of Quran which says, do not mischief? Or the 40th verse of 42nd chapter which says, forgiveness is better than retaliation? Or the 32nd verse of the 5th chapter which states, if anyone killed a person, he kills the mankind. Sir, I have one more question in the same context. And it is, that does Islam teaches to give priority to the religion that is dharma or madhab before the country or motherland that is matribhumi or kaum? Thanks a lot. The brother asked me very good questions. The first question is regarding concept of jihad. He says that why are people fighting? He's been to Kashmir about jihad. Does Islam encourage this fighting. What is the meaning of jihad? Does it not disagree with the quotations he gave us? Remind the chapter 5 or 32. Brother, as far as the word jihad is concerned, there's a misconception not only amongst the non-Muslims, but even among the Muslims. What most of the people think that any war fought by any Muslim, 
for any reason, whether it be for his personal gain, whether it be for politics, whether it be for language, whether it be for color, it is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jahada, which means to strive, which means to struggle, like how we have jiddo jahad. So jihad basically means to strive to struggle. And in the Islamic context, it means to strive against one's own evil inclination. It also means to strive to make the society better. It even includes to strive in the battlefield to fight in self-defense. Jihad also means to fight against operation and tyranny. Jihad basically means to strive or struggle. Many people have misconception that jihad means holy war. And many people translate jihad as holy war. The Arabic word for holy war is harbu muqaddasa. If you read the Quran, nowhere in the Quran, not a single verse, nowhere in the authentic hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is this word harbu muqaddasa mentioned anywhere. There is no harbu muqaddasa at all. The translation of jihad is not holy war at all. This word holy war was first used by the historians to describe the crusades of the Christian who spread Christianity and who killed thousands of people in the name of Christianity. Unfortunately today, many people, including so-called Muslim scholars in inverted commas, they translate jihad as holy war. It's a mistranslation. Yes, jihad means to strive to struggle. One of the striving can include fighting. Fighting also should be in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is kitar fi sabilillah. Now regarding a question, that why does Islam encourage fighting and killing? And there are many critics of Islam who normally say, Islam is a ruthless religion. It always says that we should kill the non-Muslim wherever you find them. Many critics, including the critic of India, Arun Shuri, and he writes in his book, The World of Fatwa, he quotes Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5, and says that the Quran says, wherever you find a kafir, into bracket Hindu, that you kill them. And if you open the Quran, Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 5, and if you read, it does say, wherever you find a kafir, you kill. But this is a quotation out of context. For the context, if you read the first few verses, it speaks about a peace treaty between the mushriks of Makkah and the Muslims. If you read Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, first few verses, it speaks about a peace treaty between the Muslims and the mushriks of Makkah. Now, this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the mushriks of Makkah. By the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5, he gives them an ultimatum to the mushriks and he tells them, put things straight in four months' time, otherwise a declaration of war. And in the battlefield, Allah says that when the enemies come to attack you, you kill the enemies. So this verse is revealed in the battlefield, that when the enemies come to kill you, don't get scared, fight them. But naturally, any army general today, to boost up the morale of his soldiers, he will say that when the enemies come, kill them. He will not say that, just be quiet. And Arun Shuri, after quoting verse number 5, he jumps to verse number 7. Because verse number 6 has the reply. Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse number 6 says that if the kafir, if the enemy seek asylum, if they want peace, don't just give it to them. Escort them to a place of security. If the enemy wants peace or asylum, <laughs> escort them to a place of security. Today, the most merciful army general, maximum will tell his soldiers that let the enemy go. Here Allah says don't just let them go, escort them to a place of security. So whenever these verses are there of killing, including the verse of Surah Anfal, chapter 8, verse number 60, when they say that, prepare your steed and be prepared, attack the enemy. The next verse says, but if the enemy is inclined towards peace, you give it to them. So almost all the verses we talk about fighting, after that it says that if they want peace, peace is better. Now regarding your question, what about the verses of Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 32, Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 40, that if anyone kills any human being, it's as though he has killed the whole of humanity. This is the basic rule of Islam, that if anyone kills any human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. Now if you read, if you read Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 50. It says, Krishna, Shri Krishna tells Arjun to do jihad. Strive. If you read Mahabharat, Mahabharat talks about thousands of verses of fighting. Thousands of verses. Many number of times more than what the Quran speaks. Mahabharat is a scripture, as you may be aware, it talks about a feud, a fight between the Pandavas and the Kauravas. The five brothers Pandavas and hundred brothers Kauravas fight. And Bhagavad Gita is a part of Mahabharat, 18 chapters in which Sri Krishna, Lord, he gives advice to Arjun. Arjun says, 
Arjun says in Bhagavad Gita chapter number 1, verse 42 to 46, that I would prefer getting killed unarmed rather than fighting my cousins. How can I fight my cousins? The Kauravas, my cousins. I would prefer getting killed unarmed rather than fight. Immediately, Lord Krishna. You know what does he say in chapter number 2, verse number 2 and 3 says that how could such impure thought come in your mind? It is sinful. How could you become so important? How could your heart become so weak? So Lord Krishna says such thoughts are important. They are impure. They are sinful. It will prevent you from going to the heavenly planets, going to Jannah. After that, Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 31, 33 says, he says, Lord Krishna, he says to Arjun, that it is the duty of a Kshatriya to fight. If he does not fight, he shall not go to heaven. And if you do not fight, you are doing a sin. So if you analyze in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that you have to fight. Imagine if I take verses of Bhagavad Gita and say that Lord Krishna tells Arjun that you have to kill your relatives. If I quote out of context, it will be devilish. But in context, it is Lord Krishna says that if you have to fight against falsehood, for the truth, you can fight against anyone, even if it be your relatives. So now in context, it makes sense that if you have to fight for justice, even if it be against your relatives, there's no problem. So that is the message of Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharat, fighting truth against falsehood. The moment I tell a Hindu about Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita, he has the knowledge. He says, no, but Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita is a fight between truth and falsehood. That is the same thing what's mentioned in the Quran. <laughs> so moment I quote to you Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata, you understand the Quran better. And furthermore, many people say, oh, this Quran talking about jihadi. If you do jihad, if you die, you go to Jannah. Many critics, including Arun Shuri quote, and they quote the even Hadith of Sai Bukhari, volume number four. In the book of Jihad, chapter number 2, Hadith 46, it says that a Mujahid is a person who strives in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah alone knows who strives. And further a prophet said that if a Mujahid dies in the battlefield, he'll shall go to Jannah, he'll get paradise. But if he returns back, if he does not die, he will return back with the booty of war. This Hadith and several verses of the Quran are quoted by the critics of Islam. I wonder how could the Hindu critics quote these things? Haven't they read the Bhagavad Gita? Haven't they read the Mahabharat? Even Shri Krishna, he mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 37. O Arjun, O son of Kunti, rise up and fight. Even if you're killed, no problem, you will go to heaven. And if you return back successfully, you will get the good riches of this earthly world. Same thing as the Hadith. So when Krishna says to Arjun that fight, if you're killed, no problem, you will go to heaven. If you return back successful, you will get the riches of the world. That is the same thing what Sai Bukhari says, what the Quran says. So therefore, you should understand each other better by reading the scripture. So Islam allows fighting as a last resort in self-defense or to fight against oppression. Otherwise, no. And jihad means to strive, to struggle. Now coming to your second question. Which is more important? Which is more important following the rules of the country or following the mazhab, the deen? It is like you asking me, who do I belong to first? Do I belong to my father or my mother first? <laughs> Brother, as far as following the rules of the country and following the rules of deen, Almighty God is concerned, Almighty God is our creator. He is more superior to us. Following the rules of deen is more important for us than any other rule laid down by father, mother, <laughs> or any country. But, but, I am an Indian. I know. There's not a single law in the Indian constitution which prevents any Muslim in India to follow Islam. In fact, India is one of the few countries which is mentioned in the constitution that it is the right, it's the birthright of every citizen of India to preach, practice his religion. That's what I'm doing. There is not a single law in India which prevents me from doing something which is farz or compels me from doing something which is haram. There is no law. I can offer five times a life I want. If I don't want, I can't offer. There is not a single law in the Indian constitution which prevents me from becoming a good Muslim. Therefore, as far as I'm concerned, I am a very practicing Muslim, alhamdulillah, and also practicing Indian. And it's by definition, by geographical definition, an Indian geographically is called Hindu. So if Hindu means a geographical definition, I am a Hindu living in India, and I'm a practicing Muslim.
Brother, uh, can I have your name and your profession first, please? My name is Saravana Kumar. I'm working in your bank. Uh, I understood many Hinduism now only because most of the Hindus doesn't know what Vedas is. Uh, but uh, do you agree all Vedas scriptures and Vedas chapters, everything, is it correct? Then some section of the people in Hindu only uh, learning that uh, Vedas. Not many Hindus are learning, they are not allowed to learn. But uh, those religion leaders also not uh, practicing the same what Vedas says. Is it correct? Then why they are doing like that? Please answer me. Thank you. That's a good question. The first question was, do I believe with everything what the Vedas say? Point number two, the Vedas, only a selected few Hindus, learned people, they read. Others are prevented from reading. Why? Point number one, do I believe in everything of the Veda? If you analyze, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 38, Allah says that we have sent a revelation in every age. In every age we have sent a revelation. By name, only four are mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. The Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, there was a person who asked me in Bombay also, that can I consider Veda to be the word of God? Do I consider Veda totally to be correct? See, by name, only four are mentioned. Torah, Zabur, Injir, and Quran. But there were many books revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, regarding Veda, can I consider it the word of God? Since Veda is not mentioned by name in the Quran or in the, any authentic hadith, I cannot say for sure that it is the word of God. I can say maybe it is, maybe it is, maybe, maybe not. But even if Veda was the word of God, it was meant for those people and for that time. Today, we have to follow the last and final revelation that is the glorious Quran for the whole of humankind. Regarding your question, do I believe everything in the Veda? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 79, فَوَيْلُّ الْكِتَابِ بِأَيْدِهِمْ ثُمَّ يَقُلُّونَ هَذَا مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتَرُ بِهِ ثَمَنًا كَلِيلًا فَوَيْلُّ لُّمْ مِمَّا قَتَبَتْ أَيْدِهِمْ فَوَيْلُّ لُمْ مِمَّا يَكْسِبُونَ Woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say this from Allah. To traffic with it for a miserable price. Woe to those for what they earn, woe to those for what they write. Now we realize that all the previous scriptures of Almighty God, by the passage of time, they have got corrupted. They have been changed. Today, we don't have the Injil in the pure form. The Bible that we have, it is not the Injil which was revealed to Israel Salam. They have changed in passage of time. So even if Veda was the word of God today, it has not maintained its pure form. And all the Hindu scholars, they agree. So Allah says in Surah Hijar, chapter 15, verse number 9, that we have revealed the Quran and we shall guide from corruption. Quran is also called as the Furqan, the criteria to judge right from wrong. So what I say, that whatever is matching with the Quran in the Vedas, I accept it to be true. What doesn't match, I leave it aside. Because Veda hasn't maintained its pure form according to the Hindu scholars. So what I say, whatever matches with Quran, I say I've got no objection. This part may be the word of God. But I don't agree everything of the Vedas. There are many unscientific points in the Veda. I can give a talk on that, which I don't intend giving. I can give hundreds of unscientific things mentioned in the Vedas. So what I say that this is the Furqan, the criteria, you check with this, if it matches with this, we agree it to be that part as to be true. Hope that answers the question. Do we have a question from the sister's side? Do we have a non-Muslim sister who has a question? Good evening everybody. I'm Aarti, I'm an engineering student. Um, I believe that most religions are just a set of beliefs. Hinduism is a belief, Islam is a, is a belief, Christianity is a belief. Uh, and most, most major religions like the Islam or the Hindu, Hinduism or the Christianity uh, have been formed through ages. They have, they have come past through a lot of, lot of ages. So they can, they can be a lot of additions and subtractions uh, which can add value to the religion and which can also uh, cause some kind of a demolition to the, to, the, to the name of the religion itself. So my question is, why do we have to stick on to few religious books like the Quran or the Vedas to follow a life of our own? Why can't we just take the rights, the positives and the negatives and leave the negatives alone and take the positives of the Quran and take the positives of the Vedas alone and, and lead a life of good? And, and uh, no matter what, for example, 
no matter what the vedas say or no matter what the quran says i believe that a man should have a single wife and i would definitely i would definitely not agree upon the fact that the vedas contain something like that or the quran con contain something like that it is up to my conscience to leave off the negatives of however great a religious book might be and take the positive of the book alone and why why are we here to even discuss about the the i mean why why, why are we here to even discuss about the the differences and similarities between the two great religions why can't we just take the postures of both religions and just lead a life of our own very that's good that's my question sister asked a very good question a very good question a very relevant question that why should we follow religion why hinduism why islam why christianity why not follow the good things of all and that's it finish who will decide what is good what is bad for example in america wearing skirts and shorts is common in western country it is modest so for there wearing skirts and shorts is modest if you wear in chennai if a girl walks on the streets with shorts and skirts you will call it immodest including you sister even you say she is immodest so what is modest in america is not modest here when i went to america few years back there was a person who told me that you indian women you are immodest i was shocked why how come indian women are modest because when you wear the sari you show your belly so for the american for the american the women showing the belly is immodest so who will decide if you go to certain muslim countries the arab countries looking at a woman staring at a woman is immodest here as long as you don't touch a woman you can talk to her you can look at her it's modest therefore when you greet the indian they say namaste without touching in the western countries it is common that you shake hands so shaking hand between a lady and a man is modesty as long as you shake hand and don't touch any other part of the body in some western country it is modest in other western countries kissing a woman on the lips and the cheek is modest in some western countries you can do what you want the male and the female as long as you do willingly it is modest who will decide who will decide who will decide if you go to america the nude beaches there is a ship i read in the times of india two months back a new cruise a nude cruise nude everyone in the ship will be nude for them it is modest who will decide the best person to decide is the creator sister now i am asking you who will decide what is right what is wrong who will decide and if you say that select the best i am with you i agree with you sister select the best of all the religions so that's what i've done i have selected the best from the vedas but but what is best is not best for you that's the problem i'll discuss that also i challenge i challenge any human being to point out a single principle of islam which is against humanity as a whole single i challenge i say i'm not speaking on behalf of the other muslims i'm putting my head on the guillotine i challenge anyone anyone yes there may be many non muslim may think certain thing is wrong for example the sister disagrees with the man having more than one wife i'll discuss that inshallah after i give you the answer you'll be convinced inshallah god willing you'll be convinced for example if you ask a problem 2 plus 2 is how much if you don't know the answer i'll give you the answer now once you know the answer you get convinced so what do you have to discuss sister the things which you don't agree you can come on the microphone and tell me i am just a student i'll try my level best with allah's help to try and reply no do the vedas say you can marry more than one wife the christian bible says the quran says no you don't believe in all of them no problem let's talk about logic let's talk about logic sister do you know by nature male and female are born in equal proportion by nature male and female are born in equal proportion but if you ask any pediatrician a doctor of the children he will tell you that the female child can fight the germs and diseases better than the male child so in the pediatric age itself there are more male children dying as compared to female children so in pediatric age itself there are more females than the males as life goes on death death due to cigarette smoking death due to alcoholism death due to accident death due to war more male are dying as compared to female so today in the world there are millions of women more in the world as compared to male only in some countries third world countries like india the female population is less than the male population you know why because of female infanticide according to a bbc report bbc report according to emily beckenin on the program let her die the topic was assignment every day more than 3000 fetuses are being aborted in india after they identified that the females that means more than 1 million fetuses are being aborted in india 
every year after the identified the females. If you stop this evil practice, and according to Tamil Nadu government hospital report, this state of yours, that report says out of 10 females born alive, four are put to death. Do you say it is right? It is wrong. If you stop this evil practice, even in India, the female population will become more than the male population. In America alone, there are 7.8 million females more than male. In UK alone, there are 4 million females more than male. In Germany alone, there are 5 million females more than male. In Russia alone, there are 9 million females more than male. God alone knows how many millions of females are more than males in the world. Suppose, sister, hypothetical question. Suppose my sister happens to live in America. Or suppose your sister happens to live in America, USA, and the market is saturated. Every man has found a woman for himself. Yet, there will be 7.8 million females who will not find life partners. Now, only option remaining for them, for these females who have got no life partner is that either marry a man who already has a wife or become public property. <laughs> you may say, public property? Brother Zakir, such a harsh word. Sister, it is the most sophisticated word I can use. I cannot use a better word. In America, on average, the statistics tell us a person has eight different sexual partners before you settle down with one. Mistresses is common. You can have 10, 20, 30, no problem. 100 also. The law will not say anything. If you marry more than one wife, that thing doesn't go down their throat. Why? In mistresses, the woman does not get a right. She's degraded. She's dishonored. In Islam, when you have a second wife, you have to give equal rights. She has the honor. She has respect. But I do agree with you, sister. I agree with you that no woman, no woman under normal circumstances would like to share a husband with any other woman. I agree with you. I agree with you, sister. But, but, the basic law of the Islamic Sharia is let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. Let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. So all the Muslim, all the Muslim women who know that there are millions of women, if they would not allow their husband to have more than one wife, they would become public property. They say, we would not mind sharing a husband to prevent our other sisters to become public property. Hope that answers the question. May we have the next question from Brother Okay. Kamala. I am Ramay Gowda from Bangalore. I am an engineer, but um, publishing a magazine called Shudra Shakti. I do agree with uh, Dr. Jakir Nayak as far as uh, his thoughts are concerned, as far as uh, one God is concerned. But Mr. Nayak himself said the reformers of Hinduism have given stress on believing Vedas, not on Puranas. If that is so, can we agree with Kalki as an avatara? And second question, I will come, I will come with another two questions. If Kalki Purana and your version of Kalki could bring peace with the two religions in India, all right, give lot of publicity to it and try to win over the people. Second thing is, you said the Hindu, the, you quoted in Vedas, and a friend of mine also posed a question that in Vedas are not allowed to be read by all. It's a fact. Among Hindus, there are four Varnas. Except Brahmins, the other three Varnas are not allowed to read. Only the Kshatriyas and Vaishyas can hear. But Shudras are never allowed to read Vedas. They had no access to Vedas. So, what is Hinduism? I come, therefore, can, you, can you call, sure, sure. can you say that Shudras are also Hindus? Brother, very good but question. But you, you said Hindu is a... Excuse me, brother. People brother, belong to certain area. Brother, I do agree. please ask one question at a time. The brother asked two questions. I do agree with the second question I didn't answer. Not because I did not know the answer. I gave the first answer. Ask one question at a time. You can ask the second question. No problem. I'm here. Okay. My flight is 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> okay. One question at a time. And I'll be my pleasure. If I don't know, I will tell you I don't know. The brother asked two questions. And I gave the first answer. And when I sat down, I realized, oh, I forgot. I'm a human being. I'm not a computer. Okay, okay. So the second question, after I sat down, I realized I didn't answer. Thank you for reminding. Your main question, first question you said, 
that the Hindu reformers said, don't follow Puranas, only follow Vedas. So why have I quoted Kalki Purana? If I leave it out, what will happen? Brother, towards the end of my talk, I told you very clearly that I have quoted Vedas as well as the other Hindu scriptures. Even if you remove from my talk all the quotation of all the other scriptures besides the Veda, my talk would be the same. I am talking about the last and final messenger, not only from the Puranas, not only from Kalki Purana. I gave so many references from Vedas. I think you didn't hear. If you want, I can repeat it. Do you want me to repeat? Rig Ved, book number one. Hymn number 13, verse number 3. Rig Ved, book number 1. Hymn number 18, verse number 9. Rig Ved, book number 1. Hymn number 142, verse number 3. Tens and hundreds of quotations only from Veda talking about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I told you in my talk that even if you remove Khalki Purana, remove Khalki Avatar, yet there is Narashansa, there is Kaurama, there is Abhandu in Atharva Ved, in Sam Ved, in Rig Ved, all the four Vedas I give, all four. 100% all four. Prophecies I mentioned in my talk only few limited time. You understand, brother? So even if you remove Kalki Purana, Kalki Avatar, yet there'll be peace by only following Vedas. This believes in Tala Vila, Kalmitin Sava, Imbaina Bainakum. Come to come in terms, I've been asking you. I know many Hindus respect the Bhagavad Gita, respect Purana, therefore I quoted Purana and Bhagavad Gita. Even if you remove Purana and Bhagavad Gita, there is jihad even in Rigved. There's jihad in Rigved, and there are many things. So even if you quote Ved, my talk would be. Majority would be the same. Hope that answers the question. Now coming to your question with the other brother post, that why in Hinduism only certain people are allowed to read the scripture, others aren't, and you're right that Brahmans are allowed to read and Shatya are allowed to listen and Shudras are not, are Shudras Hindus. According to Vedas, Almighty God, he created from his head the Brahmins, the learned class. From his chest, the Kshatriya, the warrior caste. From his thighs or stomach, he created the Vaishyas, the business class. From the feet, he created the Shudras. So this is a caste system which is there in Hinduism, which I don't agree with. Even the reformers, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, he disagrees with. Justice Anade, he disagrees with it. What Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, Ya you are nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'ba wa qaba ila litaarafu inna kramakum inda Allah yatkaakum inna la alimun khabir O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honor in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment is not caste, it's not color, it's not wealth, it's not sex, but it is taqwa. It is God consciousness, it is righteousness, it is piety. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 70, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَ بَنِي آدَمَا We have honored all the children of Adam. Whether you're born in a Hindu family or a Christian family or Muslim family, if you're a Bani Adam, if you're a human being, you have been honored. In Islam, all human beings are equal. The only way you can be superior is by taqwa. It's by God consciousness. It's by piety. It's by righteousness. So I disagree with this concept. What I believe, and there are many scholars who say, this has been incorporated so that the higher class, the Brahmins could rule. What they came with the philosophy, you Shudra, you are a Shudra, Lokas, behave like a Shudra. If you serve me better, in the next life you'll become a good person. But this life, you serve me. So this, I believe, is not the word of Almighty God. That's the reason reformers of Hinduism, they spoke against this caste system, against Brahmanism, Kshatriyaism. So according to me, if you analyze, this caste system is wrong. And the religious scripture should be read by anyone, whether rich or poor, whether businessman, whether warrior, whether king, because this is a book of the Creator. Almighty God. And everyone should know what our Creator wants us to do. Hope that answers the question. Yes, right. And I'm Srinivas, and I'm working in a courier company. See, I've been searching for the truth for, say, I mean, say, say, since my teenage itself. And uh, I somehow I started hearing about the Quran. And when, since I was touring throughout South India, I happened to stay at different places and at different times I used to come across several people who were traveling with me and I used to ask them, tell me something about Quran and all that. And of course I prayed to God and finally he has sent Jahangir Bai and Kaiser Didi. They gave me every detail regarding the Quran and uh, I'm very much convinced with the truth the Quran speaks and uh, I'm happy to announce that I took my shahada this evening.
before this session. Takbir. In your exhibition hall. And uh, see, my, I, I just have a few questions to post to Mr. Zakir Naik. You know, one is, still I do not have a Quran with me. So I just hear people reading out Quran. And out of that, I, I just memorize few verses. One of them is Quran 1740, which says, Did Allah give you sons and take daughters from the angels? Truly you utter, a, I mean, you utter a lie. There is a verse. I didn't understand this, one thing. The second thing is, what is Harur? Harur, the companions of uh, men in the, in the heaven or something, friends, like spirit forms. What the brother referring to Hur, Hur. Sorry. Who, who, companion? Uh, yeah, in the heavens. The brother has called a verse of the Quran. In the verse of the Quran, the brother asked a question first. I have to congratulate you, brother. You're most welcome Thank to you. the region of peace. Thank you. I request one of the volunteers that please get the translation of the Quran of Sai International. Please get it. Yes, inshallah. And ask someone to get the translation of the Quran. Inshallah, I'll give you a copy of the translation so you can have a translation of the Quran with yourself, inshallah. Okay. I regarding a question that there's a verse in the Quran which says that you give daughters to Almighty God and sons for yourself. This verse is narrating, as I told you in my talk, that Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ikhlas, chapter 112, verse number 3, wa lam the begets not nor is begotten. Almighty God doesn't have any children. So in argument to that, they say that you give children to God, Leave aside giving children, you give daughters to God and sons for yourself. It is a rhetoric question. First of all, giving children to God is wrong. And leave aside children, you are giving daughters to God. And to yourself, you are giving sons. That means why are degrading? Because in the society, you know, at that time, in that society, sons are considered more superior. So why are you degrading God? And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 88, Allah says that anyone who says, Allah has begotten a son. It is the most heinous thing you can say. They say that Allah has begotten a son. Indeed, they have put forth the thing most monstrous. Anyone who says that Allah has begotten a son, it is the biggest abuse you can give. It says, وَقَالُوا تَقَذُ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدَا لَقَدْ جِيتُمْ شَيْنْ إِدَّا تَقَادُوا السَّمَوَاتِ وَتَفَتَّنَّا مِنُّ As though the skies are ready to burst. وَتَنْ شَكُلْ أَرْزُ The earth to spread asunder. وَتَخِرُ الْجِبَالُ حَدَّا And the mountains to fall down to utter ruin. Allah says that if the sky had feelings and if they'd have heard that Allah has begotten a son, they would have burst open. If the mountain had feelings, the mountain would have split asunder. The earth would have split open. So therefore, to say Allah has begotten a son is the biggest abuse. So these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he uses many things as rhetoric. Allah also says, tell to them, if Allah had the son, I would be the first person to bow down to him. Rhetoric again, rhetoric. That means if Allah had a son, I would be the first person to bow down, indicating Allah does not have any son. So similarly, this is another rhetoric used in the Quran, that if you say that Allah has got son, you give daughters to Allah and sons to yourselves, so all these verses are indicating that Almighty God does not beget. Neither is he begotten and he does not beget. Now coming to your second question about the companions. The word that you mentioned is Hur. And Allah says in several places about Hur. Mentioned four places in the Quran. In Surah Tur chapter number 52. In Surah Dukhan chapter number 44. Surah Rahman chapter 55. In Surah Waqa chapter 56. Four times the word Hur is mentioned in the Quran. It is talking about the companions in the hereafter. When you go... This life is the test. In the hereafter, if you go to Jannah, your companions describing that they'll have all big, beautiful eyes, etc. And they'll be ladies. Now the question posed that in Jannah, if you go to Jannah, if the men will get beautiful women, what will the women get? Men will get beautiful women in Jannah, in paradise. What will the women get? So this question was even asked to Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. So she said that they will get what the heart hasn't desired, what the eye hasn't seen, what the ear hasn't heard. Means even the women, for their companionship in the Jannah, even they'll get something what the heart hasn't desired, what the eye hasn't seen, and what the ear hasn't heard. These are descriptions of Jannah. They are giving you the highlights, what's going to happen in Jannah. There'll be rivers flowing of milk and honey. If you're a rich person, you can have river of milk flowing beneath your feet. But that milk is different than the milk that we know. 
The fruits talked about in the Jannah is different than what you know. The who's talked about that is different than the girl that you know. It is nothing compared even to Miss World or Miss Universe. That is far superior. I would request uh, all the brothers and sisters who have a question to please form a queue so that the volunteers get an opportunity to identify and bring all of our non-Muslim uh, friends right in the front. Yes, brother. See, I'm, I'm I, coming I, to I, I appreciate this uh, movement, Peace to Humanity. Really, it's a movement. It needs in our country. But the quarrel is not based on the religion. Please understand, the division in this country is not based on the religion, it is not based on the God, it is not based on the scriptures. It is based on self-interest. Politicians and certain communities, certain castes who feel that they are the superior and they should control this country, they create it. In the name of religion, they are fighting. Not in the name of the God. Everyone knows God is the same. Everyone knows we, we worship the same God. But here, the, what contradicts is the superiority. Brother, one caste, one brother, particular caste, who me, brother, themselves you, as Hindus. Can you please come to the question? My brother has a question that he agrees that religion doesn't call division. It is the politician, and that's what I told in my talk. In the conclusion of my talk, I did mention that the British had the policy of divide and rule. And unfortunately, most of the politicians, they have inherited this policy. And they get the vote bank by division and rule. So therefore, this talk, I've told that if all the Indians, the Hindus and the Muslims, if you go back to the scripture, these people are like khutwa to shaitan. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 168, Ya Amun, O you believe, do not follow the khutwa to shaitan, the footstep of the devil. So we get impressed by these politicians. Therefore, we should go back to our scripture and follow the established truth of the scriptures, then inshallah, we will not be deviated from these people and come back. And my request to the politician also, even my request to the politician is that if you try and get the vote bank, by getting to the established truth, you will get a bigger vote bank. Irrespective whether you get a vote bank here or not, in the akhirah you will get a seat inshallah. In the next life. May we have the next question from brother at the back. I am Pawan Kumar Sharma. I am a mechanical engineer uh, from Haryana. I have read some verses of Quran in another exhibition hall. On those verses, Messenger of God has told to common people, to common men, that you should come to the mercy of God, Allah. And uh, Allah will bring joy and make your life prosperous. And if you not come to the mercy of Allah, your life will be full of sorrow. I want to know what this here Allah means, whether it is Almighty God or the God followed by only that Messenger. And if God is one, then whatever be the religion those tribal people are following, then Almighty God will bring prosperity to those people also. Well, that's a good question. I would just request that the brother who has just accepted Islam, I would like to present to him a copy of the glorious Quran, the translation. I request the brother to come on the top. The brother asked a question that he read a verse of the Quran that if you come to the mercy of Almighty God, he will take you to the right path, otherwise you go astray. So is he talking about Allah only of that messenger or this different messenger, different Allah? Brother, as I told in my talk, that Almighty God is only one, but he has sent several messengers, but all the messengers preach the same message. In the Quran, by name, 25 messengers are mentioned, Adam, Moses, Abraham, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. All the messengers, they preach the same message, that believe in one same God. There's no different God for Hindu and different God for Christian and different God for Muslim. All the human beings have got the same God. What we say in Arabic is Allah. You can give any name to Almighty God, but it should be a good name, it should be a beautiful name, it should not conjure up a mental picture. So here it says that you come to the mercy of God, means that if you follow the guidance of Almighty God, 
and the guidance is given in the last and final revelation of the Quran, then inshallah you'll be successful. As I mentioned, this life is a test for the hereafter. So all the messengers, whether it be Adam, whether it be Noah, whether it be Abraham, whether it be Moses, whether it be Jesus, whether it be Muhammad, peace be upon them all. All these messengers, they spoke about the same Almighty God. And they called all the human beings to the same God, not different God. So what we realized, that the messages kept on getting corrupted. The moment the message got corrupted, Almighty God sent a different messenger. Same as Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, verse number 7. Whenever there's unrighteousness, I come. But who comes? Almighty God sent the messenger. In every age. So here we understand that all the messengers preach the same message. But the previous messages have been corrupted. This is uncorrupted. God says in Surah Hijar, chapter 15, verse 9, I have revealed this Quran and I will guard from corruption. Hope that answers the question. Do we have a non-Muslim sister? Yeah, this question is on behalf of a non-Muslim sister. Okay, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Brother, a non-Muslim sister, she doesn't want to be identified. She says, what is the concept between the similarities in worship between Hindus and Muslims alike? Like shaving their heads like the Hindus do in Tirupati, and the Muslims do during Hajj, and the Hind Hindus circumambulate the temple, and the Muslims do during the Tawaf. My sister asked a very good question. What are the similarities between worship in Islam and Hinduism? And she gave an example that when they go for pilgrimage, they shave the head. Muslims also, when we go for Hajj and Umrah, we shave the head. They circumambulate, and we circumambulate, all similar. There are many similarities in worship. As far as the shaving the head is concerned, the reason we Muslims, when we go for Hajj, we have to shave our head, is for humility. For humility. That we are humble before our Creator Almighty God, and normally, you know, hair is a form, you know, for style. Therefore, you find that many men and women, they go to have hairstyles, you know, different, different hairstyles they have. So when we shave, we are just showing humility that our humbleness is due to Almighty God only. In Hinduism also, they have a similar concept of shaving for humility. It is matching. Regarding circumambulation, the reason we circumambulate, people object that if Islam is against idol worship, then why do you circumambulate around the Kaaba? Why do you bow down to the Kaaba? Don't you worship the Kaaba? And the Hindus, they circumambulate and when they worship. The difference between the Hindu circumambulation, Muslim circumambulation, is a difference of chalk and cheese. We bow down to the Kaaba in a Salah, it is as a sign of direction, it's a Qibla. Kaaba is a Qibla. If we offer Salah, we have to offer in the same direction. Today, if you want to offer Salah here, some will say let's pay north, some will say south, some will say east, some will say west. So for unity, all the Muslims face towards the Kaaba. So those living in the west, they face towards the east. Those in the east face the west, those in north face the south, those in south face the north. And if we analyze Kaaba, the world map, the first person to do the world map was Al Idrusi in 1154. When the Muslim drew the world map, North Pole was down and South Pole was on top and Kaaba was in the center. Later on, the Western cartographers came, they turned the map upside down, North Pole top, South Pole down, but yet Kaaba is in the center. <laughs> the reason we circumambulate around the Kaaba is because Allah has told us, Prophet has told us we do it. My logical reason I can think is because every circle has got one center. When we circumambulate around the Kaaba, we are testifying that there is only one Almighty God. But if you circumambulate around the Kaaba and believe many gods, they are not doing wrong. And regarding worship, the statement of Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, in the book of Hajj. He said that I am kissing this black stone. This black stone can neither benefit me, can neither harm me. I'm kissing it just because my prophet kissed it. This statement of Hazrat Umar is sufficient to testify that no Muslim worships the Kaaba. And furthermore, my argument is, during the time of the prophet, there were Sahabas who stood on the Kaaba and gave the Azan. No idol worshipper will ever stand on the idol he or she worships. So this proves that we Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. It is only a symbol. It is only a Qibla. And regarding other similarities, sister, there are other similarities. There are various other forms of worship in Hinduism. One form of worship is known as Shashtang. Shashtang from Kamsha, Asht means art, and Ang means part of the body. Eight part of the body. 
One type of worship in Hinduism is eight part of the body, touching eight part of the body. The best way you can do is like we Muslim do the sujood in Salah, touching our forehead, our nose, our two hands, two knees and two feet, shashtang, eight parts of the body. Forehead, nose, two hands, two knees and two feet. And sujood is the best part of the Salah. It is mentioned in several places in the Quran. And furthermore, regarding Makkah, the mention of Makkah is even there in the Hindu scriptures. The word mentioned for Makkah in Hinduism is Elai Spad. Ila, as I said, is God, and Spad means place. So Elai Spad is one of the place of Pirtha, place of pilgrimage, which is mentioned in Rig Ved, book number three, hymn number 29, verse number four. Elai Spad, in the Sanskrit dictionary, Elai Spad is place of God, house of God. It's a place of Tirtha, place of pilgrimage. Same thing as mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter three, verse 96. The first place for worship was Bakka with another name for Makkah. So Makkah is even mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. And it says that this Elaispad will be in the Naba Prathvi, means the center of the earth. As I told you, Kaaba is in the center of the earth. And furthermore, the few verses later, Rig Ved, book number three, hymn number 29, verse number 11 says, it talks about Narashangsa, the prophet who is called the praiseworthy. So because this prophet is also mentioned along with Elaispad, it's very clear cut that one of the places that the Hindus should go for pilgrimage is the Makkah. Hope that answers the question. Can we have the next question for brother on yes. my right? I am Devraj. I am a metallurgical engineer. I am working as a senior manager in tractor and farm equipments. Dear brothers and sisters, today is an excellent evening, I can say. It's a really an eye-opener to all Hindus. And I was really amazed, astonished, surprised, and whatnot about the illustrations given by Dr. Zakir from various Vedas Upanishads. <laughs> I have to admit, and most of the people here also will admit, it's really a God's gift given to Dr. Zakir. <laughs> One thing I could notice here is the specifications are very clear in Islam for the human being to be followed. In Hindus, it's not clear. It's there, it's not clear. <laughs> lot of misinterpretations are there. Lot of interpretations and opinions, beliefs is based on. There, it is there, but in a different format. My request to the organization is to call Hindu scholars and Hindus and arrange for a debate so that truth will come to surface. <laughs> so that Hindus and Muslims can become much closer and closer <laughs> and be together to, to be together towards the prosperity a unity and peace for the nation and society. Thank you. Thank you. The brother has given a very good suggestion and I appreciate him. I do agree with him. It's an eye opener for many of the Hindus, even for the Muslims. It's an eye opener even for the Muslims, brother. I'm sure. Is it or not? Yes. And the brother has given a very good suggestion that we should call the Hindu scholars and have a debate, I would say rather a dialogue. And that is again based on the verse of the Quran, which I started my talk with Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, which says, Come to common terms as been assigned you. And that's what I'm doing, brother. I'm traveling different parts of India, different parts of the world, having dialogues with scholars of Christianity, of Hinduism. I'm only a student. I'm not a scholar, I'm a student of comparative religion. And I've had discussion dialogues in Kerala with Hindu priests in Bombay, and now, there's a request, inshallah, I'll be going to Bangalore very shortly within a couple of months, that Shri Shri Ravi Shankar, he has requested we should have a common dialogue. <laughs> and you might have heard of the person, uh, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar. He's of great fame. He has got centers in 40 different countries of true living. And if anyone in Madras, if you can organize, brother, if there's any priest in Madras, we would love to have to come on a common platform and have a dialogue. I was there in Madras and I spoke with Shankaracharya of Kashi when I'd come last time, a few months back. 
and we had a discussion on the issue of Babri Masjid. Asked him some questions and I gave him some clarification of Kashi. And there's no problem, brother. We love it. We are here to come to common terms. If you can arrange any brothers out here, non-Muslim or Muslim brothers can arrange any dialogue. Just come to common understanding, but get a person who's knowledgeable. You know, knowledgeable of high standard, whether Shankaracharya or top priest, so that we can discuss and come to common terms, live harmoniously, build a big Indian nation. Do we have a question from a non-Muslim yes, sister? Exactly. Uh, question from a non-Muslim friend of mine. Uh, she is asking me, like, uh, within you Muslims itself, you have confusion. Like, uh, when you meet, you ask first. The question is uh, whether you are a Wahhabi or a Sunna, a Sunni, whatever. This kind of question, there is a confusion between you itself. What do you want us to follow? What is that uh, we can exactly come follow and... Uh, the sister asked the question that the non-Muslim sister asked. There's a confusion among the Muslim. When you meet, you ask, you are a Wahhabi, or are you Hanafi, or a Shafi, or a Maliki? So there's a confusion amongst the Muslims. So what's the reply? I do agree with the uh, non-Muslim sister that unfortunately many Muslims call different names. But when I tell the Hindus to go back to the Vedas, I tell the Muslims to go back to the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 103, Allah says, Wa tasimu bi hablillahi jami wa la Hold the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. We have to hold the rope of Allah. The rope of Allah is the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 159, that anyone who makes division in the religion of Islam, O oh Prophet, you have nothing to do with him. Making sex, making division in Islam is prohibited, it is haram. But when we ask the Muslims, what are you? Some say I'm a Hanafi, some say I'm a Shafi, some say I'm a Hanbali, some say I'm a Salafi. What was the Prophet? Was the Prophet Hanafi? Was the Shafi? Was the Hanbali? Was the Malaki? What was he? He was a Muslim. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 52, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon you, you are the Muslim. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 67, that Abraham, peace be upon him, you are the Muslim. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusila, chapter number 41, verse number 33, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَالَ مِنْ مَنْ دَعِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَمِنُ صَالِحَوْنَ قَالَ إِنَّنِ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I'm a Muslim. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad was a Muslim. Allah has told us to call ourselves Muslim. They cannot be a better label than Muslim. See, all these four great imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Malik, may Allah be pleased with them all. They were great scholars. I love them. I respect them all. They were great scholars. But all these great scholars said, all these four imams said, that if you find any of my fatwa, which goes against Allah and his Rasul, then you throw my fatwa on the wall. So here if you analyze, that all these imams that came, they came not to make a new sex, they came for the people to go back to the original scripture, the Quran, the Sahih Hadith. So what we have to realize, that I know there are people who say, that isn't there a Hadith in which the Prophet said, there will be 73 sex, it's Hadith of Tirmidhi, the Sahih Hadith, Hadith number 171. The Prophet said, there will be 73 sex. Prophet didn't say you should make. Prophet knew that even though Allah says, don't make, a bound to make. So the best is to go back to Allah and His Rasul. And the best label you can have is call yourself a Muslim. Any scholar, let it be anyone in the world, let him be the biggest scholar of the world. You ask him for proof. Produce your proof if you're truthful. If you're honest, produce your proof. So any scholar, if the difference of opinion, you ask him for proof. Get the proof, check it up. Therefore, in my talk, I always give references. What I say, what Zakir says is rubbish in Islam. It is zero, nil. Therefore, I say, Zakir doesn't say, Allah says, Qul hu Allah hu ad, say is Allah one and only. If Zakir says it is rubbish, zero, nil in Islam. If Allah says it carries weight. If the Prophet says it carries weight. So therefore, sisters, Muslims should not be divided. We should call ourselves Muslims and follow the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Anyone who divides the religion, they are going against the Quran. Yes, brother. Can uh, you pose a question? <coughs> Dr. Mahadevan, practicing uh, medical practitioner, Day before yesterday, I attended uh, Mr. Abdur Rahim Green's uh, lecture. There was a question posed to him uh, by a medical student. She asked about uh, a paradise. Those who practice Islam 
go to paradise and the rest of the people go to the uh, hell. Is it uh, the answer given by Mr. Abdurrahim Green was not convincing? Can you please explain? Thank you. Brother, the question somebody asked Brother Abdurrahim Green that those who practice Islam will go to paradise, those who don't practice Islam will go to hell. The answer wasn't convincing. I wasn't there. I'm sure Brother Abdurrahim Green may have given a very convincing reply. Maybe you didn't understand certain of his points. I know him. He's a very good speaker, mashallah. But regarding the reply that will Muslim go to Jannah and non-Muslim go to hell, Brother, the requirement to go to Jannah is given in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3. It says, well, us, by the token of time, man is very in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, that is to dawah, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. The requirement for any human being to go to Jannah is four things. Iman, faith, what I discussed pillars of Iman, righteous deed, exhorting people to truth, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these four is missing, under normal circumstances, you shall not go to Jannah. Only by calling yourself Abdullah, Muhammad, Sultan, Zakir will not take you to Jannah. Just by saying, I am a Muslim, you don't go to Jannah. I said in my talk, Allah says in Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse number 2, just by saying you believe, just by saying I am a Mumin, I am a Muslim, do you think you'll go to Jannah? Allah will surely test you. So just by saying I am a Muslim, you will not go to Jannah. A person who practices Islam, Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It also means submitting a will to God. A person who submits a will to God is called a Muslim. So a person who follows the religion or submitting a will to Almighty God is a Muslim. So anyone who submits a will to Almighty God, whatever his name may be, he will go to Jannah. So criteria to go to Jannah is having Iman. In all the pillars I mentioned, Almighty God is there. We have a messenger about the year after, about his books, etc. Doing righteous deed and submitting a will to Almighty God. If you submit a will to Almighty God, in Arabic it is called as religion of Islam. But it doesn't mean that if you live in Pakistan or live in Saudi Arabia, you go to Jannah, no. All the people in Saudi Arabia, all in Pakistan, Allah, Allah, Allah alone knows whether they go to Jannah or not. The person who go to paradise, brother, is one who obeys the commandment of Almighty God. The person who obeys the commandment of Almighty God, and I discussed many in my talk, if you obey these commandments of Almighty God, just by name, calling yourself Muslim or Muhammad or Abdullah, that will not take you to Jannah. It is not compulsory to change your name. The name, Green, is not a Muslim name. So that doesn't mean you won't go to Jannah. We prayed to him that may the brother, inshallah, well, he has reverted. He was a Christian. So the name will not take you to Jannah. Your deeds will take you. Believing, your deeds, Exhorting people to truth and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If your deeds are right, if your iman is right, and you exhort people to truth and patience and perseverance, inshallah, any human being, he shall go to Jannah. Hope that answers the question. May we have the next question from Brother here. Your name and profession? I am Rajaji, first term at New College. And my views are so controversial to him. So, but it is my duty to put my question. He has said that. Krishna has married to 16,000 wives. And why can't a Muslim to marry four or five wives? <coughs> this shows that you two religions are united in uh, suppressing the human rights. Uh, you have said that, you, you may say that women's, women are so attractive, but it's a personal perspective. And if you find so, you are, your views are corrupted and your mind is corrupted. The concept of beauty is itself is also changing. Once Cleopatra was beautiful, but it is not so. Now, Aishwarya Rai ranks first. <laughs> and uh, you, are, you are also suggested for the original text, but it, it creates only the fanatics and uh, fundamentals. When you are convinced to a particular religious ideology, you find no wrong in, the, in, the, in your crimes. That is why. That is the thing which happened in Gujarat, where 2,000 Muslims are murdered in the streets. No God has come, only communists and some Democrats' efforts were there. People are renouncing all the religious values. And for you like persons that, uh, it has come to as shock values. Religion is failed and not the people. So please allow the people to free and allow them to join their social movements like communists and Axel Bari movements. That is the brother, I believe, is a communist. He's asked a very good question. 
He's saying that if Hinduism allows and Krishna has married 16,108 wives and Islam allows, so Hinduism and Islam is joining in suppressing the women, according to you. According to him, brother, he saying Cleopatra was beautiful, today she is not. Ashwara Rai is number one. For you, not for me. <laughs> so what is beautiful for you may not be beautiful for me. I do agree with you. It is a perspective. I do agree with you. Ashwara Rai may be number one for you, not for me. So we realize, brother, the concept of difference changes. And I give the example. What is modest in America is not modest here. What is modest here is not modest in America. Who's to decide? I do agree with you. If you think that marrying more than one wife is suppressing the woman, who's going to take care of the millions of women? You. Who will take care? Will your communist movement take care? Allah, in the glorious Quran, gives you the solution to the problems of humankind. The solution doesn't go down your throat. I'm asking you a question today. There are millions and millions of women more than men. Who's going to take care of them? Who? Even if you give them charity every month, that charity will not be sufficient. See, man and woman have been made sexual by nature. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 21, Yes, put love and mercy between their hearts. I am a medical doctor. I am a medical doctor. A woman cannot remain virgin throughout her life. Cannot. It's not possible. What are you going to do? What will happen? They go to prostitution. What will a communism do for them? What is the solution? No solution. Allah gives the solution of a creator. The solution doesn't go down the throat. So the problem is, brother, that solution is that you give a better solution. Can you think of a better solution? In Islam, it's not compulsory to marry more than one wife. It's not compulsory to marry four. I don't know of a single Indian Muslim who has got four wives. I don't know of any. There are other foreigners Muslim who have got. You have to realize, brother, this is the solution. Everyone cannot marry more than one woman. Everyone cannot. But certain men who can do justice between the wife, Allah has given them permission. If they can do justice, what is troubling you? I don't understand. Where are we suppressing them? We are uplifting them. The so-called modernity you're talking about in America in the name of art and culture. What are they doing? They're degrading the woman. Your talk of women's liberalization is nothing but it is an exploitation of a body, degradation of honor, and deprivation of a soul. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman have actually degraded her to a concubine, to a mistress, and society butterflies which are hidden behind the colorful skin of art and culture. In the name of art and culture, Aishwarya Rai, what is that? Modeling, is it right? So the problem is, brother, you have to put your thinking right is important. We don't want to sell our daughters. We don't want to sell our mothers. If you want, you can do it. And the famous ad I'm told, which I gave the example last time, of the BMW. Someone told me, very famous ad. You know BMW car? It's a very famous car. Youngsters go in competition with Mercedes. In the ad, there's a woman standing in a bikini in front of that. Test driver now. Who, the girl or the car? <laughs> what are you doing? In the name of communism, in the name of uplifting the woman, you're selling your daughters, you're selling your mothers. We Muslims don't want to do it. We don't want to do it. In America, in America, you can have mistresses. 5, 10, 20, no one can stop you. So in communism, having mistress is allowed. Having more than one wife, you have to give her rights, you cannot ill-treat her, you have to give her honor, you have to give her property. That doesn't go down your throat. Who is degrading the woman, you or me? You know in America, one of the most advanced countries, these Americans who talk about that Islam degrades the woman, do you know, out of those people accepting Islam, today Islam is the fastest growing religion. Out of those people accepting Islam, Two-thirds of the people are women. If Islam degrades the woman, then why are the American women accepting Islam? Why are the American men accepting Islam? <laughs> Who forced Dr. Abu Amna Bilal Fib to accept Islam? Who forced Brother Abdul Rahim Green to accept Islam? Who? If you see the woman, two-thirds of the people are women. They're accepting Islam. Why? If Islam degrades the woman, why will they accept Islam? Because they know that Islam gives security to the woman. Islam uplifts the woman. That security may not go with your purpose of making money in art and culture. Like the politicians, they want to divide and rule. These people of art and culture talking about uplifting the woman, beauty contest, they're selling cosmetics. They make billions of dollars. You know that the beauty contest for what? In the name of beauty contest, they're making billions of dollars. So just because they want to make billions of dollars, all of many of them want to go and see. So if you realize, brother, we don't believe in exhibiting our women in front of public. We respect them, we love them, and we revere them. We don't want to degrade them. We have a non-Muslim sister. Yeah. Uh, the, the answer that you gave me, your logic and statistics, made me think for a while. 
but I still have a point to be cleared. Probably, in I mean, at a previous point of time, in those days, men had to go to the battlefield. The only source of income for a family was through men. But now it's, times are changing, and probably in the future, times will still more change, and women might go to the battlefield, and women, and right now women are, uh, are going for, for, for jobs, and probably the mortality rate for women might increase too. At that point of time, is it okay to modify and say that there can be just one wife for a, for a man? After all, religion is for mortal creatures like us and not for, not for God. So that's a very good question. At that time in wars, maybe men were dying more, and I agree with her. Now the times of wars have changed. But even today, sister, in the wars, more men are dying. In the Gulf War, more men died. In the Afghanistan War, more men died. In Vietnam War, more men died. But the percentage was much less as compared to the older. I do agree with you. Today, I gave the statistic, more people are dying of cigarette smoking, they are men rather than women. More people dying of alcoholism, more men than women. Accident, more men than women. I do agree with you that now women start going to the battlefield. And in America, when I was there in USA, just a few years back, they started a women section. Women going, and the big section of women joining the military. Do you know the president of America at that time? It was Bill Clinton, I think Bill Clinton. He had to apologize in the parliament. You know, 96 women were raped by the superior. He had to apologize in the parliament. Majority of the women that take part in this battlefield, they are raped by the superior. When you have shoulder to shoulder going to war, what will happen? See, this is statistics. Sister, this is statistics of America. The problem, I do agree with you. Sister, I do agree with your question. Your question are innocent because you don't know the statistics. Do you know the statistics? I do agree women are going for a job. In America, do you know? In America, every day, according to the statistics of 1996, U.S. Department of Justice, 2,713 women are being raped every day. Every 32 seconds, one woman is being raped. We are here in this order for the past three hours. For the past three hours, more than 300 women may have been raped in U.S. until the time I'm here. Why? Islam is not against women working. Islam is not against women working, but it is the duty of the man to be the bed earner. They can work, but it should be a modest work. It should not be modeling, dancing, singing, or intermingling with the gents. Working is allowed, sister, but if you do those work which are immodest, there are high chances that you may be degraded, there may be immorality. Yes, sister, you have some comments? Uh, I'm not talking about any... Uh I mean, degrading uh, the modesty of a woman kind of jobs. I'm talking about modest jobs, say driving itself. There are the, the, the number of women drivers in the world are increasing. What at one point of time, let's say of a hypothetical situation, at one point of time, the number of women drivers in the world increase and the mortality rate of women increase. At that point of time, is it okay for us to accept a religion and say that a man can have just one. I'm not just talking about this particular aspect of, of any religion alone. Any, any aspect of religion. Is it okay to modify religion as, as times are changing? This is a very good question. That can we modify religion as times are changing? If the religion is not perfect, it requires a modification. If the religion is perfect, no modification is required. <laughs> so if the religion has a problem, therefore I told you, point out a single fault. You are talking hypothetically. Hypothetically, after 100 years, if women start diving, if women die, if women population becomes less, if, if, if. Sister, our Creator Almighty God knows the future. You and I don't know. <laughs> he knows the future. He said a man is permitted to have more than one wife. Not compulsory, even if I agree with you. Even if I agree the woman population becomes same. It's not compulsory for a Muslim to have more than one wife. I have got only one wife, sister. I've got one wife only, and I'm satisfied with her. I don't intend marrying more. There's no problem. If someone can do it, there's no problem at all. Want to marry, marry. Don't want to marry, don't marry. But if you marry, you should do justice between a wife. So sister, our almighty God, creator, he knows about the future. Suppose doctor says, don't have cyanide. But if the cyanide doesn't harm me, and if I have it, hypothetical, the doctor knows. But a doctor is a human being, can make mistake. Almighty God is the biggest doctor of everything. He's the biggest doctor. He knows what is required for. Therefore, I said, point out a mistake now. Tomorrow, there may be something. Then, inshallah, you can come and ask me the question tomorrow, and then I'll give you the reply. May we have the next question from the brother at the back? Uh, my name is Sriram. I'm, doing, I'm an engineering graduate. Um, I'd like to pose a question. Uh, you said that Dasarath had three wives. 
and uh, we know that uh, in Ramayana, Dasar did an attempt to give equality to all the three wives, he lost his life. Do you, you can say this as a test of, test by inshallah, but is this test suitable for the wives? Because they are being suffered. Who is going to take care of the wives if the person is, not, is failing in the test? What will be the position of those people? Is this correct? The brother asked a question, that means Dashrath had more than one wife, while giving equality to the wives, the women suffered. That's what he's saying. So that's a test. The Quran says suffering is a test. So when I studied, when I studied for my MBBS exam and I slogged out, I used to slog out, believe me, even if you give me a million rupees, I would never like to appear for my medical examination again. I slogged out for the degree. So all the suffering, it is a test. It is a test. So here we realize that's a test for her. If she behaves like a good wife, that woman, and follows the commandments of Almighty God, does the duty of a wife, even if the husband does or not. She will pass the test. The husband may fail the test. So this life, brother, is a small portion. An average human being lives for about 50 years or 40 years. Some at the age of 20, some at the age of 80. Average about 40 to 60 years a human being lives. But this life compared to next life is 0 0.000000. Very small percentage. So if I tell you that in this small percentage compared to next life, I'll give you pain. In next life, whatever you want, you'll get. You say, I don't mind. You do what we want. Give me pain. Next life, I will get what I want. So good businessman will say, I don't mind trouble and pain. Like before the examination, we slog out. We don't sleep also. Why? Because we want to pass the examination. Similarly, if the wife undergoes certain trials and tribulation, whatever it is, if she follows the command of Almighty God in the Quran, she will go to paradise. If the husband doesn't follow, he will not go to paradise. If he follows, he'll go to paradise. Hope that answers the question. The next question from brother at my right and here again brother some people call uh, the religious people call God by his name and some other call the superpower and uh, scientists say cosmic energy and parapsychology it says super conscience so super conscience that is this parapsychology subject itself proves that God is existing it is always there brother can you please yeah uh, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say can is, you please repeat your question slowly yeah somebody see people call God according to their knowledge le the level of knowledge right see somebody call super conscience some people say superpower supreme being and all that so let me take the term sup uh, cosmic energy the energy which existed from the beginning and which created the world according to the scientists I'm talking to you because, you know, this, some people say it's a fabricated one. It was fabricated by the Roman Emperor Constantinople in AD 325 in Nisaya Conference. They fabricated the teachings. And in that they say, God rested on the seventh day. I don't want to mention the religion's name. And if the cosmic energy is going to rest, suddenly everything will collapse within few moments. And I would like to know what this cos cosmic energy was doing before the creation and right from the creation till the hum end of the human race. And what is it going to do after this? After the existing of Thank this you, brother. existence of this world. Thank you. I think the speaker has got the brother question. The question that some people call super conscious, some people call super power, some people call cosmic energy. Whether whatever name you give, it should be correct name. If it's the wrong name, we don't accept it. Some people give a correct name, super power. No problem. Super being, no problem. Certain names may be correct, certain names may not be correct. One of the names you say is the scientists say cosmic energy. And one of the religions said Almighty God rested on the seventh day. You are giving a quotation from the Bible. Book of Genesis chapter number two, verse number two. Almighty God rested on the seventh day. So if cosmic energy rests, whole thing will collapse. I agree with you. So we disagree with that scripture. And regarding calling God cosmic energy, I don't agree. God is the creator of the energy of the universe. He is not cosmic energy, he is more superior than that. He has created everything and everything is dependent on him. So as far as the religious scripture who says God rested, we don't agree. God doesn't require rest. Allah says in the Quran in Ayat al-Kursi, chapter number 2, verse 255, that Allah does not require to sleep, he does not require to rest. So Almighty God does not require rest. This definition of Almighty God is wrong. The right definition, if you read in the Quran, he says it doesn't require rest. And if you give any name, which is correct attribute, we have no objection. If you give the wrong attribute, there's a problem. Today, scientists are not eliminating God. They're eliminating models of God. Hope that answers the question. I would request our non-Muslim brothers and sisters 
to please come up and stand near the mic so that we are able to identify and give you a chance to pose the question. Yes, sir. My name yes. is Kali Selvan. Uh, sorry, Dr. Lady say the last uh, messenger is last last messenger is Muhammad Nabi. I heard through my friend that uh, Jesus Christ come again. Is it true or not? Anyway, that was the question that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the last Nabi, last Prophet, but one of his friends said Jesus Christ will come again. Yes, that is mentioned in the Bible also, Jesus Christ, peace will come again. It's even mentioned in the various verses in the Quran, including Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 116. And there are no less than 70 Sahih Hadith mentioning about Jesus Christ, peace will come. But the reason why Jesus Christ, peace will come again is because Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was the only messenger of Almighty God, whose follower as a whole, they mistook him that he claimed divinity. There's no other messenger whose followers as a whole, they mistook that he claimed divinity. But the Christians, most of them, they mistook that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. So that's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him up alive. He'll come in his second coming, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 116. On that day, you be my witness, ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O God. I never told them to worship me, but I said, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who's my Lord and your Lord. So in his second coming, he will come to testify that I never told you to worship me, but I told you to worship only one God. So when his second coming, he will not bring a new law. He will come as the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He will follow the same law of the Quran and the Hadith. He will not teach anything new. He will come to testify only to the Christians that I never claim divinity and he will follow the law of the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. You said the final messenger is Muhammad Abi. Again that Jesus Christ will become law. That's right. In the second coming, he will not get any new message. Messenger means to get some message. He will not come as a Rasul. He will come to testify to the Christians and never claim divinity. He will not get a new message. The message that he got, the Injil, was there about 2,000 years back. That has been corrupted. Now Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came. So even Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, when he comes back, he will follow the message of the Quran and the message of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So as a messenger, in following the message, the last is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Hope that answers the question. We have the next question from the sister's side. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Shailjo, a software engineer. I embraced Islam at the time of my marriage. I just have only one question which relates to humanity. Our topic is about peace to humanity. Does Islam or in anywhere in Quran is it specified about the human do organ donation? If it is so, is it allowed or like why is the reason that it is not allowed? So as I heard from some of my friends. Sister, the question that is there any mention in the Quran that organ donation can be done or not. There's no verse in the Quran or any authentic hadith where organ transplantation, organ donation can be done or cannot done. But all those scholars have got together and there are several conferences taking place in Makkah, in Riyadh, in Malaysia. And the scholars unanimously agree that organ donation and organ transplantation can be done if three criteria are fulfilled. Number one, the person donating the organ, it should not cause a major loss to his health. I can't give my heart. If I donate my heart, I will die. But doctors say, that I've got two kidneys, one kidney sufficient, and if my mother, both her kidneys have failed, I can give a kidney to her, even she will survive, and even I will survive. So point number one, the person donating the organ should not cause a major loss to his health. Point number two, the person receiving the organ should be a major benefit for his health. Point number three, it should not be for money, for economic reasons. Person can't sell his kidney. So if these three things are fulfilled, the scholars say, under these conditions, organ donation can be done, organ transplantation can be done. Hope that answers the question. Please pose your question. Yeah, my name is Amresh. I got a question. What do you think why God created us? Do you think he created us to send here for test in order to categorize us for heaven or hell? Well, that's the question, why did God create us? And on the second day of this conference, I gave a talk on purpose of creation for about one hour, 15 minutes. I don't intend to repeat the lecture. One of the reasons is that God created us for the test for the year after. This life, as Quran says in Surah Mul, chapter 6 and verse number 2, Allazi khalaq al mawta wal hayata. He has created death and life to test which of us is good at deed. And besides that, one of his unique creation is he created the human beings who have a free will. We can either obey Almighty God or we may disobey Almighty God. We have been given the free will. And Almighty God asked us before we came in this world, who would like to become a human being? So we opted for that. You and I, 
in the previous life before we came to this world. We opted for that. So based on that, Almighty God gave us a free will. Now after we get free will, we either have the option to obey God or disobey God. If we obey God, we get Jannah. If we disobey God, then we don't get Jannah. So this life is a test for the hereafter. Other creations, angels don't have a free will. They always obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we opted for the test. We opted for the test, so we're undergoing the test. So based on this test, we will get our reward and punishment. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Dhariya, chapter 50 and verse 56, Allah says, Wama khalaktul jinna wal insa illa li abdun. That we have created jinn and the men not but to worship me. So one of the reasons for our creation is worship. And there's a test for the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require us to worship him. Whether we worship him or not, he is yet great. It will not diminish him. It will not make him superior. We are undergoing the test. For our benefit, we opted. It is like I opted to appear for the medical examination. I opted. So the teacher, she corrected, okay, fine. And I passed the test. So similarly, brother, we opted and we are undergoing the test. And for the complete answer, you can refer to my video cassette, The Purpose of Creation. Yes, brother, can we have the next question from you? Respected sir, I have four questions. First you one is, sir, brother, please, hard to believe. Please, please mention your name and one question at a time. Shijil. Uh, there are some uh, hard to believe uh, instances in any scriptures. For instance, uh, in Quran, like uh, birds dropping stones in a uh, battlefield on the enemy's uh, uh, context like that, uh, which is hard to believe. That's my first question. There's a question that certain thing mentioned in the Quran, like birds dropping stones, talking about Surah Fil. Surah Fil, chapter number 105. There are many things, for example, Quran says about Shakkul Qamar, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam split the moon into two. Musa Alayhi Salaam split the sea into two. These are difficult things, yes. These are known as miracles. Miracles are those things which a human mind cannot conceive how it happened. For us human beings, to make the moon into two is not possible. For us human beings to split the sea into two and have a pathway is not possible. So these are known as miracles, which only God can do. You and I cannot do. So it's difficult for us to conceive. The only way for us to testify is to go back into time. Here sitting now, we can't go back 3,000, 4,000 years back and check up whether Musa alayhi salam, Moses did he split the sea or not. So what we say, these are miracles which doesn't allow us to go back in time. But there are many things which Quran has said which has come true today. For example, Quran speaks about science, about the Big Bang, Quran speaks the light of the moon, not its own light. Quran speaks the earth is spherical. Quran speaks the sun rotates, which to a man 1400 years back would sound, what is this nonsense? That the moon has its own light? That the earth is spherical? All these things about the Big Bang. But today after science has advanced, we have come to know it's a fact. But to know what happened in the past, we can't go back in time. So what my logic says, whatever the Quran has mentioned, certain things we can check up now. Certain things we can't check up. We can't go back in time. So that goes in the ambiguous lot. So what things we can check up today? Out of those things, whatever we can check up, so 80% things we can check up. So my logic says 80% of what the Quran mentioned, we can check up today, and we have come to 100% correct. Whatever we can check, not even 1% is wrong. Most of the contents are historic, I think so. Yes, that's what I'm telling you, brother. A historic, for you to say that thing didn't happen, you can only prove by going back in time. If the Quran says Prophet Moses split the sea, you can't prove that he didn't split. Neither can you prove he split. But we can't go back in time. Can we go back 3,000, 4,000 years back? Can we go? We can't. So what we say logically, this may have happened, may not have happened. May have happened, may not have happened. The birds may have dropped stone, may not have dropped stone. Correct? What we say, this is ambiguous. If we talk about the nuclear bomb, 1,000 years back, would they have believed? Would they have believed? They would have said this is nonsense, right or wrong? But today you and I believe or not? Because science will advance. Similarly, there's nuclear bomb, there's atom bomb. So birds dropping stone, what's the problem? It is so easy. Nuclear bomb is more difficult. So here we realize we cannot go back in time. So what my logic says, whatever we can testify today, whatever we can analyze today, out of that, 100% has been proved to be correct. 20% we can't analyze, we cannot go back. We can't go in future. We cannot prove scientifically whether there's heaven or hell. So you'll ask me, Brother Zakir, you're a medical doctor. How do you believe in heaven and hell? 
I said that goes in the 20% ambiguous slot. So my logic says when 80%, what we can check today of the Quran, has been 100% to be correct. Not even 0.1% is wrong. So my logic says what 20% is ambiguous, inshallah, God willing, even that will be correct. Maybe science will advance after 50 years, after 20 years, we'll come to know about life after death, we may come to know about heaven or hell. So my logic says there's a logical belief that when not even 0.0001% has been proved wrong of the Quran, 80% is 100% correct. So my logic says, inshallah, the 20% which we can't verify by going back in time or going in future, even that inshallah will be correct. Hope that answers the question. May we have the next question from brother here. Hello, I'm Ashok here. I'm doing my MA economics in Loyola College. So my question is that in this time of, at this time of this, like uh, every world is in a very distress. We are in a way of, we want peace. Whether there is a region, whether it's a religion peace or whatever it is, we need peace, we need some humanity. And we have lots of people from outside countries also. So is the religion is the sole thing that we are doing so much of problems all around? Is the religion is the sole problem for that? We are demolishing the WTO all around and we have lots of problem over there. And is, is the religion is the solution for the things happening all around the world? And is it the solution for the people dying in Ethiopia? We have children dying out of hunger. Is the solution, is the religion solution for them? What is the solution for the real thing for what we are wondering all around? Is it the religion is the only solution for what we are debating all this time? What, I think so we need Thank some you, solution for that. Thank you, That's a good question that we are having so many problems in the world. Is religion the solution for this problem? There are so many people dying in Ethiopia. Is religion the solution? Brother, the religion which is true is the solution. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in Nadina in the Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is submitting a will to Almighty God. If every human being submits the will to Almighty God, you won't have a problem in Ethiopia. Allah says in the Quran and several Sahih Hadith that the third pillar of Islam is every rich person who has a saving of more than the Nisab level, 85 grams of gold, should give 2.5% of his saving in charity. If every rich human being gives charity, poverty will be eradicated from this world. Leave us at Ethiopia, there will not be a single human being anywhere in the world who will die of hunger. Do you know that the three richest men in the world, the three richest men in the world, their wealth is equal to 48 poorest countries GDP. Three richest men. If all of these people give zakat, it will solve the problem of the humankind. So the problem is that if every human being follows, follows the religion of submitting his will to Almighty God, like that you gave one problem. Any problem you get, Alhamdulillah, the glorious Quran has the solution to the problem. Follow the right religion and you'll get real peace. Do we have a question from the sister's side? Yeah, there's a question a from the non-Muslim sister. Asalaamu Alaikum. When a Muslim is in a non-Muslim's house at the time of prayer, at the time of Salah, can he or she do his prayer in their house? Or what is the right way to do it? And can a Muslim take prasad fr from the temples? So there are two questions. Number one is, can a Muslim pray in the house of a non-Muslim? As long as there's nothing which is wrong in the house, as long as there's no idol in the front, as long as the place you're praying is a clean place, you can pray any part of the world. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, I'm number one in the book of Salah, that the whole world is a mosque for the believers. So as long as the place is clean, and doesn't break any rules of the Sharia, there's no idol in front, you can very well pray. Regarding taking prasad, prasad is a food which is given by the Hindus in the name of deities and gods. Allah says in the Quran in no all than four different places. In Surah Baqarah chapter number two, verse number 173. In Surah Maida chapter number five, verse number three. In Surah Anam chapter number six, verse number 145. And in Surah Nahal chapter number 16, verse number 115. Hurramat alaykumul wa ma ahulla li gairilla bi. Forbidden for you for food are dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken. So eating prasad is haram. It's not permitted in Islam. But we know many Muslims, you know, we don't want to offend. We don't want to offend our non-Muslims. So what they do, some of the Muslims, they say Bismillah and have it. So tomorrow you'll say Bismillah and have alcohol. After that you say Bismillah and have pork. 
eating any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken is prohibited in Islam. How to deal with them? You can refer to my video cassette, Dawa or Destruction, which shows you a way how to convince the non-Muslim regarding the concept of Prasad and how to convince them through their scriptures about the true concept. Hope that answers the question. The next question from the brother at the back. Yes. Um, I want to make one thing clear. Is everything test of Allah? Is everything a test of Allah? But that was the question that, is everything a test of Allah? This life is a test. Sometimes we are self-create problem for us. We are self-create problem for us. So this life, brother, is a test for the hereafter. Then you mean to say that, say that nobody reaches heaven because to heaven is to human. The brother said that if that's the case, then nobody reaches heaven because it is human to her. And I agree with you, brother. I agree with you totally. It is human to her. Everyone will make a mistake. That's the reason our beloved prophet said, and I mentioned in my talk on the second day, that no one can enter Jannah without the grace and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I said that in my talk. That we human beings make mistakes, but Allah is forgiving. He is ghafoor, he is rahim, he is merciful, he is beneficent, and he forgives his people. But even he has rules and regulations. Even he himself doesn't just say, okay, fine, you look good, I forgive you. You don't look good, I don't forgive you. He has got his rules and regulations for the human being mentioned in the Quran. So you can only go to Jannah with the mercy of Almighty God. If Almighty God catches every mistake of yours and gives you a negative point and gives you a positive point for all the good deeds that you do, then no human being will enter Jannah, not even Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi himself. That's what the Prophet said. It's a hadith of the Prophet. It's mentioned in the Quran that Allah will multiply your good deeds by 10 times. But the wrong thing, you only count as one. So because of this mercy of Almighty God, he forgives many of his mistakes. The only thing which will not forgive, it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 48, and in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 116, that the sin which Allah will never forgive is the sin of shirk, associating partner with Almighty God. Any other sin, if he wants, he may forgive you, because associating partner with Almighty God is a sin which is the biggest of them. Hope that answers the question. Do you have a counter question, brother? Yeah, then you mean to say that a person who is doing all good deeds and making an error in having three wives but not treating them equally, will it be, uh, he, he, will he be at any heaven? Well, the will question that, if, will yes, that not I want to put a question one? that if a person, if he has three wives and doesn't treat all his wives equally, can he go to Jannah? He can go, why not? Because see, for us to be absolutely pure, you yourself said it is human to err. With all the good things, Something evil thought may come in your mind. Even that's wrong. So if you make mistakes, you ask for forgiveness. A person who doesn't treat his three wives equally, if he asks for forgiveness, Allah may forgive him. Allah may put him in Jannah. His other good deeds may be so much that Allah will forgive this. So that depends on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's the master of the day of judgment. A person should treat his wife equally. But if he doesn't treat, he may go to Jannah, may not go, depending upon all his full life put together, Allah is the master of the day of judgment. He may go, he may not go. If he asks for forgiveness, Allah may forgive him. Hope that answers the question. Uh, we'll take this. Yes, brother, you have. Sir, what are the uh, halal uh, or uh, allowed means of entertainment in Islam? What about the role of music? And what about Sufi vision of Islam? Does it come inside the framework or is it outside? Brother, that's one of the halal ways of entertainment. Entertainment is your perception. What is entertainment for you may not be entertainment for me. Like people today are being entertained. They're getting knowledge and entertained. This is halal. So, the halal way of entertainment are those entertainment which doesn't go against the Quran and the Sunnah. What is mentioned haram in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, if you abstain from that, all the other ways are halal. As far as music is concerned, Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that music is not permitted except for duff. Except for the duff, one-sided open drum, every, all the other music is not permitted because it takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, takes you away from remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the reason it has been prohibited. And the third question was, the Sufi thing of Islam. Sufi is an Arabic word come from Suf. It is again more of a deviation. In my earlier answer, I told you, the right concept is following Quran and the Sunnah. So if you follow anything which is not mentioned in the Quran, the Sunnah, and say it's part of deen, then it's a deviation. Most of this is a deviation that you have of the Sufism. It's more of a deviation. It's not 
The right Islam is following Quran and the Sunnah. Any scholar says anything, let him be any scholar, you have to go and see in the Quran and Sunnah. Any other source, the right source is Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Most authentic uh, English translation, most authentic, near, near opinion. Most authentic English translation, brother, the Arabic is the word of God, is 100% without any error. All the translations are human work and they're bound to have errors. So they cannot be error-free translation. Yes, but amongst the translations available, the good one that I feel, one of them is the Sai International, the English translation I'm talking about. Other languages you can ask the local people. In English, one of the good translations I feel is the Sai International, which has been translated by three ladies who originally American, the Western they were, and they accepted Islam. Sai International, the copy which I gave to the brother earlier. And if you want, I would like to give you also, inshallah, after the talk, you can contact Brother Ashraf. He will give you a copy of the Sai International, and you can read the translation. Hope that's the best. Thank you very much. Most welcome. Okay, we have a non-Muslim brother at that mic. Uh, can we have the question from you? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Srira. I am a Hindu. Uh, without practicing uh, Islam, do you mean to say it is difficult uh, by practicing Christianity or uh, by Hinduism to go to uh, attain the uh, paradise after death? That's a very good question. That without practicing Islam, can you practice Christianity and Hinduism? Can you go to paradise or you cannot go to paradise? Brother, as I said, the Quran says in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, inna dina in the la Islam. The only religion acceptable to Almighty God is submitting will to Almighty God. If you read Christianity, the word Christianity is not there in the whole Bible. Like how Hinduism is not there in the Hindu scripture, the word Christianity doesn't exist. It's not there in the Bible. The word Christian was used first time in the book of Acts by the people to describe the followers of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. It was a nickname by the people given of Antioch in the book of Acts, if you read. Christian. The word Christianity is not there in the Bible. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, preached nothing but Islam. Therefore, he's going to come in the second coming to testify. There's nothing like Christianity. Abraham, peace be upon him, Quran says in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 67, he was not a Jew or a Christian, he was a Muslim. Abraham, peace be upon him, taught Islam. Moses, peace be upon him, taught Islam. Again, Islam. Don't think Islam is okay, fine, I have to have a Muslim name, I have to live in an Arab country, I have to have a Zakir name, Abdul. Islam means submitting a will to Almighty God. If you submit a will to Almighty God as a Muslim, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God. Anyone who says that I follow not my will, the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon the Muslim, he preached Islam. I've given the talk on similarities between Islam and Christianity. And I've proved that even in Christianity, they say believe in one God, don't believe in Trinity, don't make images of Almighty God. God is not begotten. All from the Bible. From the Bible I've proved how to offer Salah. From the Bible, about Zakat, about Hajj, should not have alcohol, about modesty from the Bible. So even Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he did not come to preach Christianity, he came to preach Islam. And Almighty God is the same God for all the human beings. He has only given one religion, no other religion. All these are corrupted form of the original religion. Like how the brother said, Sufism. Even that's a corrupted form of Islam. It is not Islam at all. What we have to follow is true Islam, the Quran, and the Sahih Hadith. And all the messengers, they taught only Islam. So if you follow Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, by going to the scriptures, Jesus Christ never said, worship me. He never claimed divinity. In fact, there's not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that he's God or where he says, worship me. But the Christian says, you cannot enter paradise until you believe Jesus Christ died for your sin. He was Almighty God. There's not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that he's God or where he says, worship me. If any Christian can show me any statement in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he says, worship me, I'm ready to accept Christianity today. In fact, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, he said, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I with the spirit of God, I cast out devil. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. He submitted his will to Almighty God, he is a Muslim. 
It's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. It said, Ye men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles which God did by him, and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles which God did by him, and you are witness to it. So if you say Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then I say we Muslims are more Christian than the Christians themselves. The Bible says don't have pork. Bible says the woman should cover the head. It's mentioned in the first Corinthians. First Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number 5 to 7. The woman that does not cover her head, her head should be shaved off. So, brother, all the messengers of Almighty God, they taught nothing but Islam. Islam is submitting a will to Almighty God. So if you submit a will to Almighty God, you'll go to paradise. If you don't submit, you will not go. Hope that answers the question. We have time for one last question. If you have a non-Muslim brother, yes, you can ask a question. Uh, respect us, sir. My question is... Can you please speak slowly and in the mic so that we can hear the uh, question I want clearly. to know your description, like, you know, I mean, Quran's description of heaven. Brother wants to know the Quran description of heaven, and I mentioned in short, heaven is a place. It's not a Jannah. The translation of Jannah in Arabic into English is garden. It's talking about a bliss, a place of bliss, where it gives a description that there will be rivers flowing beneath your feet, rivers of honey, rivers of milk, talking about fruits, pomegranates, etc. This place is your reward in the next life. Uh, uh, sir, uh, respect us, sir. Yes, you said you uh, want a description of Jannah. Uh, yes, sir. Respect us, sir. How will we be in heaven? Like, we'll be like normal human beings or like... I ah, mean, the brother like, said I mean, uh, one more thing, sir. Like, if you can't find heaven here, I don't think we'll be able to find heaven anywhere. I mean, the brother honest opinion. How will we be? How will we be? We'll be the same. Brother, here we require many things. There it is different. We will not be the same. There we'll be in a different form. How will we be Allah Alam? We'll be different. We won't have all these evil thoughts coming if you enter Jannah. Our, our mind or our soul as such, I mean, as you describe, how will it be? That will come to an inshallah when you go to Jannah. So you and I pray then, that then, we go to Jannah, sir, then, then inshallah. You are, you're taking me to some place where, like, you don't have any description, I mean. Sorry? You're taking me to some place which you can't describe. I mean, That's I mean, why I told you, you asked me the description, I started giving the description, then you told me not of the place, how will I be? How will I be? Will I have a beard? Will no, I be I'm young? Not talking, I'm not talking about beard or anything as such, I'm talking about your, your soul, your mind. Our soul will be there. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 185, Mawad. Every soul shall taste death. Our soul will be there. Our body will not be there. Our soul is there, will be there. But how will we be resurrected? Like an old woman who died at the age of 80. How will she be resurrected? Young or old? Allah alam. It will be different. I mean, I'm not talking about the body as such. Okay, you're talking about the soul. Okay. Soul will be there. So you're, you're telling soul is responsible for everything. Soul is responsible for all these things. That's and it. All these actions and all these things. That's right, brother. I mean, how do you, if I go to heaven, then I'll think about like, okay, I'll have like 17 virgins whom I can have six, okay? I can think of like, okay, fine, there'll be some other place better than heaven. I mean, it'll be like going on. I mean, how can, how will it end? I mean, basically, the evils are due to man's desire. I mean, how That's right. How, how, how am I sure that in heaven I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be happy with the same mind and soul? That's what I told you, brother. How will you be sure? I told you. If this book, there's something like logic. If I verified this book, 80% of these books I've verified to be 100% correct. Remaining 20% is ambiguous. Neither right, neither wrong. So I, as a person of logic and a medical doctor, my logic says when 80% is 100% correct, 20% is ambiguous. Ambiguous, not known. This book is, is, is difficult to refute. I mean, you take, you take... Brother, you are saying it's difficult to refute. You can hear my video cassettes. You can hear my video cassette. I had a debate with Dr. William Campbell in Chicago on the topic of Quran and Bible and the right of science. You see, if I want, I can refute many books. But today my job here is not to refute, to come to common terms. If I want, I can give a talk on the differences in Hinduism. I can speak about the scientific errors in Hinduism. In the Bible, my job is not that. What I've done is a presentation on the commonalities in Islam and Hinduism. What I've spoken is the established truth, what is mentioned in the Vedas. I've picked it up and presented it to the people. If you agree with the Vedas, you follow. If you don't agree, the choice is yours. So even the Vedas speak about Swarg, about Narak, about heaven and hell. You like it, you accept it. Don't like it, don't accept it. We'll come to know on the Day of Judgment who's right. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. Jazakallah khair. Now I request Brother Green to make a vote of thanks. Brother Green. I would like to uh, thank the people of Chennai for coming for this marvelous uh, talk by 
uh, Dr. Zakir Naik. We learned a lot tonight, alhamdulillah. And I hope that we're all going to use this uh, knowledge for the benefit uh, to, inshallah, let other people know about this beautiful religion of Islam. And uh, we want, would also like to congratulate all the brothers and sisters who partook in making this fantastic exhibition such a great success. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair, brothers and sisters.